you know, thank you, Michael Peabody, for that piano playing. Uh, where are you? Where'd you go? Uh, uh, there, okay, in the back. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. You know what it did? It took me back to when I was a child. My father plays piano just like you, Michael. And, um, and, uh, and he loved this song. Isn't that, isn't that an awesome song? Amen. You know, what do we have to look forward to? See, that's, that's, what's, what's the whole purpose for the Seventh day Adventist health message? The whole purpose is so that we may be healthy enough to be, better be able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others, but also attract them through a mutual interest in health and truth in health to more important truths, which is the gospel. Okay, so, so uh, yeah, so I, I, I really in, enjoyed singing about what we have to look forward to and what the whole Christian commission, <clears throat> the health ministry commission, attract others to Jesus, okay, so that they can make the choices to do what is right and ultimately be with us with Jesus for eternity in heaven, uh, being ambassadors to worlds unknown to us right now. It's going to be an awesome opportunity, and I look forward to being there, and I hope that all of you will be there as well. Okay, so as promised, <clears throat> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to first go over the things that I didn't get to during the sermon, okay, which I think are really, really important. And, um, you know, we're, we, we had talked about the... The editors-in-chief of two of the top medical journals in the world, both admitting that, man, I don't know if you can really believe uh, at least half of the studies coming out in our own journals. Okay, so um, the, what's, what's interesting is that, you know, I, like I said, I've been on many boards. Uh, I've, I've witnessed how decisions are made. And frequently, board decisions are made on financial reasons, right? Some of it is understandable. Others are not so understandable in terms of the ethics or integrity standpoint. It, it reminds me of a story that Dr. Um, Joel Furman told. He, uh, he uh, basically started out about the same time I did, uh, except that he was an um, Olympic sil silver medalist um, and, and uh, ice skating. He was he a was very gifted athlete, went into medicine, and we started practicing essentially lifestyle medicine about the same time. And um, in fact, uh, we were on the board of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine together, and I asked him, I was actually sitting next to him at one of our board meetings, and, and um, I said, hey, you know, uh, uh, would you mind endorsing uh, my next book? He said, oh, I'd love to. I'd love to endorse because he's an author as well. And so I was looking forward to him endorsing my book entitled Goodbye Diabetes, which came out about 10 years ago. And it's basically a comprehensive lifestyle medicine book on how you can reverse diabetes, type 2 diabetes, pre-diabetes and insulin resistance, which is the number one most common driver of heart disease and of dementia. Okay, so, so almost regardless of why a patient comes to see me, I almost always have them do an extended glucose tolerance test where they, they have a blood test at the lab and they're given us 300 calories of glucose to drink, 75 grams, it's called the glucola drink. And then we check their blood sugars and insulin response to that blood sugar every hour for four hours. So, um, so I would do that and, and, and determine you know, what's going on in their metabolism and then help them reverse that condition. So the vast majority of the time, we can actually reverse, reverse type two diabetes. But even if we're not able to reverse it because there's been too long, too much damage to the pancreas and its ability to produce insulin, so they become more like, uh, to some extent, like a type 1 diabetic because they've lost pancreatic function. So the more important thing is we're going to improve their health and prevent complications, right? That's what it's all about is improve health and prevent complications. So, so, um, so I, I came out with this book and I asked Dr. Furman, I said, hey, um, 
uh, I'd like to get your endorsement. So he says, yeah, you know, send, a, send a copy of the book, uh, the draft, and, and I'll read it, and then I'll write an endorsement. So I did that, and he, he wrote back immediately, says like, oh, Wes, says, I can't endorse this. I go like, why? What, what did I say? You know, what did I write? He says, because I'm coming out with a book on reversing diabetes the same month as you are. So my publisher wouldn't let me endorse it. And so, uh, but he, he then told the story, which was really telling about this whole topic of who do you trust? So um, there was a, a very well-known diabetes journal that's more, more related to, um, to the diabetic patient as opposed to for the diabetic doctor, okay? Or the doctor who treats diabetes. And so this, this journal um, was a, a regular monthly journal that would go out to many, many, many thousands and millions of individuals who had diabetes. And uh, the editor of this journal found out about Dr. Joe Furman, who is basically writing a book on reversing diabetes. And he goes like, she goes like, wow, this is amazing. He says, could you write a series of, of articles for our journal. And so Dr. Furman says, of course, of course. So he wrote a series of four articles for this journal. And the editor was thrilled because it was basically case study after case study of individuals that had out of control diabetes for many years had actually been able to reverse their type two diabetes. But then one day the editor of the journal called Dr. Furman uh, in kind of a guarded tones explained that the, um, the board didn't really want those articles published. And she was trying to understand. So like, wait a minute, you know, we're, 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 this journal is all about helping people with diabetes, right? And what could be more important than potentially helping them reverse their diabetes? But see, there was a problem because a board member had mentioned, had mentioned uh, uh, to the team, says like, well, wait a minute, you know, we have a fiduciary responsibility to those individuals and organizations that sponsor this journal, that pay us to make this journal available. And who are those individuals? It's the makers of the medications for diabetes management. Now, I have nothing against having available medications for diabetes management, unless they're being used to the exclusion of actually addressing the cause of the problem. Right? Right? Okay, so, and there are people that really need the, some of those medications, especially insulin. Um, uh, I have many, many patients who require insulin. Well, how do I know? Because I measure their pancreatic ability to make insulin. I can measure that. It's called the stimulated C-peptide test, and I can measure the, the amount of actual insulin that is in their body. Then I can compare the insulin that's coming from the injection versus the insulin that's being made by their own pancreas. And I know when somebody needs insulin. Uh, so, but... When, when patients are being withheld information about how they can improve their metabolism to the point where they no longer need a medication or need less of that given medication, then that is unconscionable, that is unethical, and that shows a lack of integrity at all levels of care, all levels of care. And so, and so um, what the... The, what uh, Dr. Furman says, well, you know, do I need to rewrite this in some way? Because uh, um, was, she wasn't exactly explaining why they didn't want these papers. And so ultimately, ultimately the editor says, well, you know, our board has, has, has requested that you kind of rewrite this and say, we were able to improve health and decrease the need for as much medication but don't say that they no longer needed medication. And Dr. Furman, he said, what, you're, you're asking me to lie? 
You're asking me to deceive? You're asking me to change the information from what it actually was? So that this, this uh, pharmaceutical company will go along with the article? And he refused. And those papers were never published in that diabetes journal. Now, I, I tell you that because, unfortunately, that is not an unusual case. And, and I know this is a fact because I spent many decades being told by many of my colleagues that were essentially thinking of me as a quack because I even mentioned the idea of reversing diabetes. They say, you can't say that. That's not scientific. There's no evidence of that. And I would say, hopefully very respectfully, <laughs> I would say like, wait a minute. Okay, if you spent five minutes looking at the medical literature, you would know that that's not a true statement. You would, you would know that, in fact, this, this is the beginning of my story on the issue of diabetes. I'm a student at Loma Linda, 1985. Um, I, because my, because, um, because of the I, I had lack of grants that year, and I wasn't able to get grants because the previous year I accepted money from my parents, and, and so I had to go a whole year without basically much, much income or money coming in from grants or parents because I had to prove that I no longer had money from my parents. And so there was a whole year while I was at Loma Linda where I actually had to cut back my, my class load so it wasn't as expensive. But you know what? That was the most educational year of my entire training at Loma Linda because I started going to all the conferences and all the, uh, the grand rounds. I went to more, more meetings that year. I was in more learning scenarios than I ever could have been if I'd just gone to classes, <laughs> regular classes. And, uh, and one, of this, one of the programs I went to, I heard uh, a lecture by Dr. James Anderson, who at the time was the chief endocrinologist for the University of Kentucky at Lexington. He was the, one of the most researched diabetic doctors, and his focus and expertise was reversing diabetes. He had published his studies in the 70s, and yet, when I heard his presentation, it's the first time I'd even heard of the concept as a student in the field of preventive medicine and lifestyle medicine. First time I even heard the concept that you could reverse diabetes, you know, because we were all in a preventive mode. Well, you can prevent it, but once you got it, you're going to have this condition for the rest of your life. You're going you're to need medications for the rest of your life. Okay, so, so Dr. James Anderson as a highly respected endocrinologist worldwide, was, was preaching. He was like a health missionary. He's like, this is reversible. And yet most people took that information and walked off as if they'd never even heard it. But I purposed in my heart in 1985 that I was going to use this information to help as many people as I could. And that that's was the, the beginnings of getting ready for, I guess, 25 years later, I wrote the book on uh, Goodbye Diabetes. Getting rid of reversing diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes, and insulin resistance naturally. Um, it's, it's interesting that um, even though many, many doctors felt that what I was saying was unscientific, they would listen. Why? Because I knew what I was talking about. I, was, I, I had the research. I, 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 I had, and so th this is a real interesting uh, quick story. Uh, when I was a medical missionary on the island of Guam, the government quickly realized that they could take advantage of me, and I spoke at most of the conferences that were put on by by the, the, the uh, Guam government. 
and they would have a national diabetes conference every year, and I frequently was a, a main speaker at these conferences. And uh, one year, this was um, 2004. In 2004, the president of the Guam Medical Society called me up and said, hey, Wes, we'd love, to give you, uh, we'd love to have you give a talk at our next big conference. This was a conference that was inviting doctors and other health professionals from all over the Pacific Rim, from Hawaii, from, all, from Asia, and it, there was going to be a lot. It was going to be a big group, over 500 uh, participants from the Pacific Rim. And the topic was on diabetes. And so I said, we'd love for you to talk on reversing diabetes with nutrition. And so knowing, knowing the political fallout of such a topic, knowing about how that was, you know, that was not a popular theme in, in scientific circles because it was thought to be incorrect and quackish, I said, I said, doctor, are you sure you want me to talk on that topic? He goes, oh, yeah, they'll love it. I go, okay. I don't know if you set me up or what. But uh, so well, that, Sunday, that Sunday afternoon, I walk into the Hilton, right on Ipau Beach, beautiful white sand bay, um, overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And, um, and it was a double, double uh, ballroom with all these doctors and other health professionals were. And as I was walking in to get ready to give my 90-minute presentation on reversing diabetes, uh, <laughs> Uh, I was listening to the, the keynote presenter at the time, and he was, a, he was a, a geneticist that was talking about genetic engineering principles and how in the future there was going to be the potential te technology would allow for the reversal of diabetes using genetic engineering principles. And I remember that, well, that's interesting, you know. So I, I, I tucked that away in my mind. So I went on to give a presentation that I thought was well received by the audience. Uh, 90 minutes later, uh, the chairman of the scientific committee comes up, comes up to the podium and he goes, um, before we take questions for Dr. Youngberg on this topic, on his lecture, I just wanna go on record that as chairman of the scientific committee, I completely disagree with what Dr. Youngberg said. <laughs> kid you not. I mean, you can't make this up. And, and, I remember, and he went on to kind of explain himself. Um, he, he was, uh, interestingly enough, his, his um, kidney dialysis clinic was in the same medical complex as our lifestyle medicine clinic was, right across the hall from each other on the, on the first floor. And so, uh, so we, you know, we would run into each other a lot. And, uh, and I could tell, by the way, that he wasn't necessarily trying to make me look bad. He was just trying to make sure that he didn't look bad, <laughs> right? Okay, but there's a difference, right? He, he didn't necessarily, to my knowledge, have anything against me. He just didn't want to be criticized by his colleagues like, hey, you know, you're the chairman of the committee. How could you allow this guy to talk about something that we know is not correct? Even though they don't really know that because you don't know what you don't know. Okay, just like um, it's been attributed to Mark Twain. It says the man who doesn't read has no advantage of the man who can't read. It's actually not a Mark Twain quote, but it's been attributed to him. And, uh, and so the, 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 the doctor or health professional who doesn't actually look at the medical literature critically and widely doesn't have an advantage of somebody that doesn't know anything about it. Okay, even though they think they know something about it, they just don't because they haven't looked it up. They haven't taken the time. They haven't lived it. They haven't experienced it. And so I knew that this physician was just speaking from his heart, his own experience. And as a dialysis physician, he's dealing with people who've had diabetes for, what, 20, 30 years? And at that point, you're probably not gonna find people that are gonna reverse their diabetes, okay? Um, the more, the, you're more likely to reverse a condition if you catch it early on in the first 
five years, 10 years, 15 years maybe. But, but if you get to the point where you have complications of diabetes, to the point where your kidneys don't work anymore, chances are your pancreas isn't working anymore either very well, right? Okay, so, so you can still do a lot of things to improve your health, but you're not gonna be able to reverse it without the need for any medicine. So, so I understood that, why? Because I've lived that too. And um, so I wasn't holding that against him. So I just remember, here, I'm a medical missionary. And, and, and I'm there to attract people to Jesus Christ. I was praying, says, Wes, do not allow yourself to get hostile and get into a back and forth with this other doctor. And so I'm praying for God to give me wisdom. And as he was explaining himself, a thought came to me. Um, and, uh, and as he ended, I, I said, first of all, doctor, I appreciate you bringing that up. Because there's probably dozens of individuals in the audience who feel exactly the same as you do. I understand that. I used to have that perspective myself. Until I looked into it, my, until I looked into it and studied it and, and very deeply. And he said, um, and then I said, um, and I'm glad that, that you brought in this, this expert from Europe on genetic engineering because that is exactly how lifestyle medicine operates epigenetically to change the expression of our genes so that we are now able to reverse something that otherwise would not be reversible. And I remember during that, that process, I was looking at the audience and they were looking at me and they were looking at him. You could have heard a pin drop during that process. And I was so grateful to God. God gave me those words. Those weren't my words. I would have naturally, you know, jumped all over him. You know, like, what are you, an idiot? No, I would never say that, I hope. Okay, but sometimes we think that, right? Uh, that, that's the human nature in us all. And, um, and so uh, the, the, the next day, the very next day, I'm, I'm rushing to work. And the AP News comes on the radio in my car. Okay, and... And it's a big study that was just released by the Journal of the American Medical Association showing that those who underwent bariatric surgery, like over 76% of them were able to fully reverse their type 2 diabetes in less than a year. Now, I'm not necessarily an advocate of bariatric surgery. That's not my point here. My point is that that was a study that demonstrated the reversibility of type 2 diabetes. And the same mechanisms would apply in many respects if we did that naturally through diet and lifestyle, etc. Uh, so I'm, <laughs> so I, I, I listen to that, I go like, oh, okay, that's good. So vindication, right? <laughs> vindication. And so I, I park the car in the parking garage, jump in the elevator, and who should be in the elevator with me? But my physician friend across the hall uh, from the dialysis clinic. And my first impression was to say, hey, did you see uh, that new JAMA article that came out today? I chose not to, because I knew he was a researcher. He was gonna figure that himself. And within a month, we were actually collaborating on research together. So how we respond to one another in uncomfortable circumstances can make all the difference in the world on how people accept what we're hoping that they will eventually accept. Okay, so, um, uh, so I'm, um, I'm sitting on the board of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and I'm actually one of the founding directors, you know, which means I, I helped start it. There was about 10 of us doctors that started this organization, which is now one of the, like I said earlier, one of the fastest growing disciplines or medical specialties in the country. And, um, and I, was asked to, I, I, I was asked to do a talk on reversing diabetes with lifestyle medicine. This was about nine years ago. And of course, I'm 
preaching to people that are already interested in it, right? So I'm, I'm preaching to the right crowd here. Um, and, uh, but what was interesting to me is that that section of the, that afternoon of the talks was being sponsored by a journal that was taking money from Monsanto and NutraSweet. Not just taking money, but they actually had a dietitian that worked for Monsanto, NutraSweet, Searle Company, who gave a presentation before mine. And I could tell that the audience was very uneasy because this was a highly educated audience, mostly physicians. And they're going like, what is going on here? Here is this new organization that is espousing lifestyle medicine, can, helping doctors change their approach from just, just uh, basically prescribing medications and not addressing the cause of the problem. And now, and now we, have, we have a talk that's basically advocating that you can have all the NutraSweet and aspartame you want, and it's actually good for a diabetic. Now, let me just read this, because I wrote this out last night with very, very great care. Um, so they were blatantly arguing that aspartame was good, you know, NutraSweet, that, that, that type of uh, sweetener. By the way, any artificial sweetener is bad for diabetics. Any. Artificial. Natural sweeteners, not so much. Okay, so this is such an important topic that, you know, I was aware of this decades ago. And as my kids grew up and they went to a party, okay, and they would ask me, so, well, can we have like a diet soda? I said, absolutely not ever. I would allow them, I would allow them have a regular soda occasionally, but I would never allow them to have an, a, a, diet, a diet soda. Never. Okay. Now, that, I realize that many people are going like, what? That doesn't make any sense. Diet sodas don't have any calories, so how could they be bad for you? Well, there's a lot of things that don't have calories that will kill you. Okay, you got, you got to just be a little logical about this, right? So, so at, at first look, the initial logic seems intuitively scientific because carbohydrates uh, and, and calories in general increase blood sugars, right? Okay, and aspartame or NutraSweet has no calories and therefore doesn't it follow logically that it would not increase blood sugar. But you see, that's actually very myopic and very illogical and unscientific to think that way. It's, it's the surface that seems logical, but the core of the science it's very clear that there's many things, there's dozens of things that will cause, will cause um, an increase in blood sugar. They have nothing to do with the calories you're consuming. For instance, okay, and, and by the way, this relates directly to the topic of optimizing the immune system. If we want to have a healthy immune system, we have to also have a healthy metabolism. Because a weak metabolism where your, your pancreas has to produce a lot more insulin to try to control the blood sugars is really is damaging the immune system. Okay, so, so one of the first things, remember during COVID, which group was at the highest risk of dying of COVID? It was the obese person that had diabetes, had the highest risk of dying. Okay, why? Because insulin resistance actually drives uh, a, basically a weakened, dysfunctional immune system. So, so if you have prediabetes, insulin resistance, or diabetes, one of the best things you can do for your immune system to protect yourself against cancer, to protect yourself against any infection, uh, and to protect yourself of heart disease and many complications is to do your best to reverse your insulin resistance, prediabetes, or diabetes. Um, so, so the um, so it's it, what's what's really interesting about this topic is that studies have been sh have shown for many years now the the NHANES data from the government census, where they do studies during the census, they show that the, the level of toxins, pesticides, et cetera, in your blood 
have more to do with uh, more to do with your chance of becoming pre-diabetic or diabetic than how much you weigh. See, a lot of people mistakenly think that diabetes is simply a condition for people who are overweight or are sedentary or both. And yes, those things play a big role, but they're not actually the main causes. So, so in other words, what we're exposed to in our environment, we probably won't get this t- to this later today, but I spend a lot of time in my practice determining whether somebody has a problem with mold. And I'm not talking about mold allergies here, as important as that might be. I'm talking about just simply having a mold problem in their home or their car or their work environment where they're breathing in mold toxins uh, uh, during the day or night. Okay? And that in itself is dramatically increasing immune dysfunction. So we, we could talk a whole hour about that. We won't. But I'm just giving you an idea that, you know, what's interesting, and, and this is something that we were clued into by Ellen White's writings over 100 years ago, and yet it's still not being addressed cl- uh, clinically in normative or conventional medicine, and it's not being taught in the medical schools. So about she, she, she reports, she had a letter, and I could show you that letter, where she said that, that two of her children died prematurely her oldest son and her youngest baby, and both of them died because of mold exposure. She says that right in her letter. Mildew and mold exposure. Okay, so don't think that, that um, you know, I used to think when I was in Guam, you know, which is, can be a very moldy place because it's right in the middle of the Pacific, uh, that mold's not going to hurt me because, you know, I, I eat well and I'm super healthy and I thought I was, I thought I was immune to mold. That's a whole other story. I was not immune to mold. It was affecting my health in a dramatic way. And it was only when I tested my urine sample for mold toxins, when I tested my blood for what's called the human leukocyte antigen, biologic biotoxin susceptibility test, and, um, and measured mold in my home that I realized what my problem was. Okay. But that's, that's another topic for another day. Okay. So, um, the, so toxins are, are important. There's all kinds, and NutraSweet is in So I just want to show you here. I just want to show you that here, here is a paper that was uh, published in the journal Diabetes Care, which is arguably, it's widely considered to be the top medical journal in diabetes management. It was published uh, last year in 2023. And it says artificial sweeteners and the risk for type 2 diabetes in a prospective cohort, they had, they had a, a, a 105,000 people go through this study. This was not a small study. Because you, you can go look it up right now. Google it. And 90% of what you find on Google is like, oh, yeah, you can have all the NutraSweet you want. It's not going to affect your diabetes at all. And it's 100% wrong. So that's, that's another case in point. You gotta be really careful what you believe these days. And, 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 and that's even fact checked. It's fact checked, and had, yes, it's a fact that, what, what, what's a fact? There's no calories. And the assumption is it can't affect your blood sugars. But that's the wrong assumption. It's just not true. Okay, so, um, so b- bottom line is if you consume uh, diet sodas or other forms of uh, aspartame on a regular basis, you have a 69 percent higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So once again, and and by the way, people look at studies like this and go like, how come this has never come up before? This has come up for the last 20 years. This is not new information. But researchers keep saying, this is the first time we've noticed this, like, what, are you not reading other people's research? I mean, this has been going on for at least 20 years. Okay, so so once again, sometimes you can't even trust what the, the researchers say. This is the first time it's ever been shown. I've seen that so many times, I don't even pay attention to that anymore because it's usually not true. Okay, so, um, so anyway, anyways, that is uh, a key indication that that was a problem. So then, then we're dealing with the whole issue of, of disinformation, which of course is defined as information that is false and the person who's disseminating it knows it's false. 
But then you have misinformation, which is information that is false, but the person who is disseminating it doesn't realize it's false, uh, believes that it's actually true. And then you got this new definition called malinformation, which is defined, and, and I just pulled this off off, off uh, UNESCO, which is Un United Nations definition. Um, it, it's kind of a weird definition, but it's, um, it's information that's based on reality. In other words, it's true. Okay, but it's used to inflict harm on a person. That's malinformation. So do you know now that we can state the truth? And if somebody thinks that that somehow is harming somebody, that we're now guilty of malinformation. It sounds really bad, but we're guilty of telling the truth. Okay, so, so um, uh, interesting information there. Now, the... Um, So, um, so in early 2020, uh, February, you, any of you remember early 2020, right? The world was going through crazy time. And, um, and so I was madly looking at the literature, coming up with a plan, right? Because I'm always looking at, what do we do about this new information? How do we prepare for it? Uh, what is appropriate to be done? And, and so I decide, I, I've known for many decades, actually for over 40 years, that hydrotherapy is a powerful way to reactivate the innate immune system. And we already knew at the time that COVID, based on the earlier studies 10 years before with SARS-CoV-1, right, they, they, that that the problem was is that for the first week or so of the infection, there is, a, there is a depression of the innate immune system. So the very part of the immune system that should be able to fight off the virus is basically an R&R. &R. It's just not doing anything. And so it's allowing that virus to replicate and to take over. And by the time the innate immune system goes like, whoa, what's going on here? Let's do something about it. It's too late. And, and, and the condition is, is to the point where the, the, the illness, the respiratory illness is now very serious, okay, or it's already causing autoimmune issues, et cetera. Uh, I, had a, I had a mother uh, contact me from Mexico City in early 2020, desperate. She was using a, um, a, a translator to explain to me that she had had bad COVID in early 2020 and her 11-year-old daughter did not, get, did not get the symptoms that she had, but uh, about a week later got really bad diarrhea and started feeling really weak. They went into the hospital and then astute physician immediately checked a finger stick blood sugar and it was over 900. So this 11-year-old this girl had contracted COVID as an infection that had none of the respiratory symptoms at all, just diarrhea, which is basically actually a really important symptom. Gastrointestinal distress is, is now actually one of the main symptoms that people have when they get COVID or a, a similar viral infection. It's actually infecting the gut. Okay, so that is why in a little bit, I'm going to share with you the importance of having charcoal as a remedy. And I, 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 I remember going to um, uh, ASI meetings years ago, you know, 15 years ago, and they would be uh, really gifted uh, presenters joking about the traditional Adventist, you know, uh, cure-all, charcoal. You know, kind of making a joke from up front. Like, you know, hey, well, all good Adventists have charcoal, right? You know, you got a problem? Take charcoal. You know, <laughs> you know and so it was funny. It was funny, but it, it may have discouraged some people or even embarrassed some people to the point where they said, you know, this is kind of weird, you know, this drinking this black shake, you know, like can't be that good for you, you know? And, and yet... And yet, if I could only have one thing 
This is real important. Listen, listen carefully. If I could only have one thing in a society that is falling apart, and we know that's going to happen someday, hopefully not soon, okay, but the sooner that happens, the sooner we get to go home too, right? So it depends how you look at it. Uh, so we don't need to be afraid, especially if we're aware and prepared. That's really important. Don't fall, fall into the state of fear because the state of fear is what causes people to give up their rights and to do whatever, whatever some agency says to do uh, that they know is not a good idea, but they do it anyways because they're afraid. Never make decisions based on fear. Okay? Uh, make decisions based on truth. Okay? What's real. And we know from our health message that one of the best things that we can do if we have especially GI, and really the, the truth is any viral illness of any kind, you can use charcoal appropriately because the body's trying to get rid of the virus through the digestive tract to eliminate that virus. And so, you know, that's why the Chinese, you know, the way they test for COVID, rectal swab. That's the, that's the best and most accurate way to test for COVID is a rectal swab. Because what that's where all the viruses, not all, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that, it, but that's where many, if not most, of the viruses end up, because the body's trying to eliminate them, which means we should not suppress the diarrhea. We should continue to hydrate and flush that out. Okay, and using charcoal will bind anything in the digestive tract that is bacteria, fungal, viral or toxic of any nature. It'll bind it and eliminate it. Charcoal's like a black hole that will take that toxin and make it irretrievable. It's one of the best things. And you know, uh, Ellen White, some say she was actually a messenger of God. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm being facetious. Yeah, I, of course I believe that, but I'm being a little facetious because she carried charcoal with her everywhere she went. Some people would look down on her for that. Like, you know, using that folk medicine. Come on, can't you use something that's a little bit more respectable? Can you, can't you take a little Tylenol with you or something that's more respectable than charcoal? It's kind of like name and saying, like, what? I got I to gotta dip myself into, into the Jordan River seven times? I mean, we, I, got, I got much better rivers where I live. I'm not going to do that. But that's what was necessary to be healed. Charcoal is good stuff. If I could only have one thing in my medical arsenal in the future, especially as, as society breaks down, it's charcoal. Number one, by far. Why? Because it would, you know what happens if the power goes out in the water and the water stops running? What's going to happen within a few days? Intestinal diseases? are going to be rampant throughout the entire community, wherever the power is out. And you can't call 911 at that point. You can't go to the hospital at that point. Right? That's not going to happen. So I have enough charcoal in my home to treat my entire neighborhood. I hope I never need it. Okay? But it's better have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Right? Okay, so... So have, every family should have at least one big jar of activated powder charcoal, okay? That's really, really, really critical. And every family should have multiple little bottles of charcoal capsules. Very inexpensive, both of those are extremely inexpensive. Okay, every time I travel, in fact, I have charcoal with me in my car right now. Anybody need some? <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, so it's, uh, I, I don't go anywhere without it. I don't go anywhere without, without iodine spray, without charcoal, and, um, and if I'm going to be gone overnight, I have a nebulizer with me. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, so, so these, are, these are really important principles here. And, um, and so in early 2020... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. All right, all right, so charcoal. The, the short answer is that even a living a little bit goes a long way. But if I had like 
food poisoning. You know, if, if, if I, like for instance, uh, we were in Dubai in May. And, uh, you know, Dubai is an amazing city, you know, high tech, beautiful city. And uh, we were staying in this really nice resort and my wife gets food poisoning. And, and it's, it's the night before we're supposed to fly out in the Emirates, you know, that 15 hour flight back. And my wife had recently seen the video of that one lady on the airplane who had diarrhea. She was running down the aisle of the airplane. You know, not, not to create the wrong images here, but, but that was the image in her mind. And, and she was freaking out because she was basically, you know, having real, real bad uh, symptoms. And so, but this is what saved her and what saved our ability to get on the Emirates flight the next morning and get back home, which we desperately wanted to do. Okay? And that was, um, she immediately after eating lunch um, noticed something was wrong. Something that she'd eaten didn't, didn't sit with her. And so she immediately took charcoal. We had capsules. You know, when you travel, you're, not gonna, you're usually not going to carry a bottle of the powder. That powder, that, if that gets, it, it, it disperses so, it's so finely, uh, it's such a fine powder that you think you're actually moving it carefully and it just goes over everything. So be careful with charcoal. Okay, but... Um, so she took it immediately and then took it again. If she hadn't done that, we would have probably had to stay in Dubai for a week and she would have to have been hospitalized. That would not have been fun. Okay. Uh, but so charcoal saved that. And, um, so she took, she basically, I think she took like eight capsules, you know, cause she had food poisoning and then she did it again. So, so normally if you're at home and you have the powder, you want to, you want to do like a heaping tablespoon. Okay, or a heaping, a heaping tape, a teaspoon as well. well. And what you do is you mix it in with some warm water first. It does not mix in cold water very well. It's just like, does not disperse. It's just like it, it sits on top of the water, right? But if you mix it with warm water, it'll mix very quickly. And then you add an ice cube to chill it. Warm charcoal water, which I call the black shake, does not go down very smooth. It is pretty nasty. It's like, it's like drinking chalk. You know, blah, it's really nasty. But chilled charcoal water, or the black shake, actually is not that bad. It's like, oh, it's kind of minty, right? It's kind of cool. Uh, and, and so uh, I remember one night uh, I come home from a lecture. This is while we were in Guam on this point. And, um, and as I walked in the door, I saw my two daughters, which at the time, were, were like uh, eight and three. And the three-year-old is now an ER nurse in Oceanside. <laughs> uh, so she knows what charcoal's all about because they use that a lot um, and, um, for overdosing. And, um, and so they kind of looked peaked. They kind of didn't look very well. And so my wife said, she said, Wes, the girls, the girls got um, tummy aches. Uh, there's a, been a bug going around. So she had some type of, a, of stomach flu. And they were like, you know, you could tell they were all ashen. And uh, so I said, no problem. We're going to make the black shake. You know, I wanted to be positive. So I walked into the kitchen and I made the mistake of letting my daughter watch me put the back sh black shake together. So I pulled out the bottle of charcoal powder and I took a heaping teaspoon and I mixed it in with some water. And then she, my, my daughter, Maddie, she looked at me with those big eyes. She says, Daddy, that doesn't look very good. And I realized my mistake. I said, oh, honey, that's not for you. That's for me. I don't want to get sick like you. And then I drank it myself. She looked at me like, well, what about me? I said, oh, you want some too? <laughs> and so she said, uh, yeah. <laughs> so the trick is with children is to use a colored cup like a sippy cup with a colored straw so they can't see it's black because most of us are not really, you know, it's, it's not very appealing to drink something that's black, like you're drinking mud, right, or worse. So, so that's, that's how you do that. And, and just use, a, for instance, when we traveled to Bali, 
or to other countries while we were in Guam, uh, we just took a little charcoal every day as a prophylactic. And so it basically kept all the bugs in, under control. So charcoal is really a universal antidote. It, it officially is the universal antidote. Not for everything, but for most things. So, well, you, you, you can, but you have to take a lot of capsules to make up for like a heaping teaspoon. So yeah, you can use chat capsules. So, so like, for, for instance, I, t I take two capsules of charcoal almost every night because that's my mold detox program because I, I was so exposed to mold in Guam that I had immune deficiency because of mold. And um, in spite of all the other healthy things I was doing, be aware of that. Okay, so, so I take two capsules of charcoal along with some chlorella every night before going to bed away from everything else. And that's, that's my bedtime detox. Uh, yes? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, if you have a big bag of powdered charcoal, can you use it and leave it in the bag? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so even if you could argue that there's some, you know, plasticizers that are coming out of the plastic, it, it doesn't matter because the charcoal is going to absorb all that anyways. And once it absorbs it, it'll never be released. That's the good thing about charcoal. Uh, okay, so, um, so again, uh, I'm... I'm I'm basically, I'm doing, I'm doing this talk in early February 2020 on hydrotherapy, right? Hot, cold treatments. Back after antibiotics became available in the 40s, hospitals stopped doing hydrotherapy. Why? Because why spend hours doing hydrotherapy when you can just give a pill or an injection or an IV and you treat the problem? Well, of course, there's a lot of reasons why you'd want to do hydrotherapy if you can. Okay, but at least we should be taking available, make a, taking advantage of it rather at home, especially if you're being sent home with no treatment. Right? That was the most egregious, unethical, low integrity thing that happened in, uh, in, during COVID. It's being sent home without without a plan. That was against everything any physician ever had been taught. It was ridiculous, okay? And so our job was to figure out what do we do, okay? And, and so hydrotherapy actually works really well, really powerfully. So we did this 90-minute presentation on hydro, hydrotherapy. Within a very short time, it was deleted, not just taken down, but deleted by YouTube. And I'm going like, what? What's going on here? It's a presentation on hydrotherapy, right? How, what, could be, what could be less harmful than hydrotherapy? It makes you feel good. It's kind of like massage, right? Oh, can't do massage, that's bad. Well, um, YouTube, this was challenged by our IT team at our church where we did the presentation in Fallbrook. And they, the, the director of our IT team said, you know, he wrote back to, he knew how to connect, connect with all these people. He says, like, what's this about? Why, why was this deleted? And they wrote back and says, you're promoting violence in the community. And, I mean, it was just like, what world are we living in right now? You know, the alternative universe. And I really didn't understand it until about a year later. About a year later, I realized that by the way, it was picked up by Audioverse before it got deleted. So it's still available on Audioverse. Um, I learned about a year later that going against the chosen narrative, and I'm choosing those words carefully, the chosen narrative of the public health agencies was that there was no treatment except the long-awaited for vaccine, right? That was the only thing that was going to save the world was the vaccine. Okay, and Dr. Robert Redfield, the director of the CDC at the time, you heard what I, what I quoted him during the sermon, that 
you know, he, he realized that the, the, the CDC and other agencies had decided, mainly through NIH, had decided that anything that in any way suggested that there was a treatment would create vaccine hesitancy. And therefore, it had to be stopped and had to be squashed. So he said that outright. Dr. Dr. Redfield acknowledged that. Okay, so, um, and this is whether or not the vaccine would be a benefit, would be safe or effective. Whether or not that's true, you know, we still need to have these other strategies, which, by the way, are extremely safe and extremely effective. Okay, so, um, so that the, going against the chosen narrative was now considered hate speech. I mean, it's kind of like a whole new world out there. Like, just when you disagree with somebody that has the normative belief of the population, that that is, in, that, that is implicitly hate speech. Just because you, have a, you disagree, even if you're right. That's hate speech. And we need to be ready for that because that's coming in a big way. Yes. That's, that's very true. That's very true. There's, 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 hundreds, there's hundreds of reasons like that going on, and, but they ignored all that, right? Um, okay, so, so bottom line is that in hate speech is now considered committing violence against the community. So you see the logic? It's, of course, an illogical progression, but in their minds, it's a logical progression. That's what they believed, or that's at least what they said they believed. I have a hard time believing that they believe that, but that's what they said. All right, so, um, all right, so let's, let's, keep, let's keep going here. Um, just, just a second, let me get through this, and then we'll take some more uh, questions. We'll have, we'll have plenty of time for questions. Okay, so, um, let's see here. All right, um, Okay, so here's the example of uh, what I referred to earlier as the enigma of unadulterated science versus the views of leading scientists, which I referred to on the vitamin D issue, and even versus the majority opinions within various scientific disciplines. So I, I asked the question here, is scientific truth determined by a majority vote? And see, unfortunately, in many scientific societies, it is. And, and that's the problem with guidelines, is that guidelines are by, what's the right word, are by definition mediocre because they're not taking the best route. They're taking the more common route that has been agreed upon. It's a it's, a, it's a, a consensus, meaning that there has been compromise in the process. And when you compromise on the issue of science, then there's always going to be a problem because you're not accomplishing what otherwise you could have accomplished if you had the best decision. Okay, so, um, so, so basically, uh, let me just walk you through my story of disinformation and vitamin D that began 20, 24 years ago, in the year, right around the year 2000. Uh, I mentioned earlier, I was, reading a, I was reading a paper, the Pacific Daily News, and, and I always looked at the lifestyle section to see if there was something new on health, right? Because I wanted to know what my patients had read. Okay, I wanted to be ready for whatever my patients brought in the next day, right? Well, what about this in the paper? Okay, so I would have a chance to review that. Well, th this was a, a, a study that was done by a Harvard physician that had looked at the statistics on how high your blood levels of vitamin D are relative to your risk of getting cancer. These were the same statistical um, 
uh, the, the same sets of data that had been used previously to show a dramatic increased risk of lung cancer in people who smoke. Okay? Same, same type of statistical analysis. And so he published this, and it instantly went across the world. It was just, you know, it was like very interesting data, because what he said was, if you, what he said was is that the power or the significance of low vitamin D in promoting, in, at least in its association with increased risk for cancer, was greater than the power of smoking and causing cancer, st statistically speaking, you know, an epidemiologic study. And so, so naturally, that created controversy because other faculty at Harvard, where he was uh, tenured, said, you know, this could actually come to damage our agenda or our focus on fighting smoking, because that was around the time where they were, you know, they were making ma a significant headway and get getting rid of smoking in restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. And I was actually part of that. And, and I, almost, I almost now take a step back and say maybe I was a little bit too eager on that. Um, because I agree that, we, that people should not be allowed to smoke in, in, in front of somebody okay, uh, that doesn't want to be exposed to smoking. But if somebody chooses to go to an establishment that, advertise, that basically is a smoking establishment, they should be able to do that. It's their right. It's their, it's, it's their life, right? So the whole thing about smoking was the beginning of a more totalitarian approach to health care. I know that's a little twist there, but, but it was. And so we got to be aware of that. So anyways, he, was, he almost lost his tenure over that issue because his research was being promoted potentially as diminishing the importance of not smoking. <laughs> right, um, which really wasn't his point. So, so that was that was the that was my first exposure to vitamin D. The very next day, I met with the lab director at my at our medical center in Guam, and I said, "I want to be able to measure vitamin D on all my patients." He's not a problem. We'll set it up, and we started. I started measuring vitamin D on every single patient, and this is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and most of my patients were vitamin D deficient. So do not let anybody tell you that if you have a little bit of sun exposure now and then, you got all the vitamin D you need. It's absolutely not true. Now, I used to believe that. Why? Because I read that somewhere. That's why I believed it. But when I actually started measuring it for myself in my patients, and I started experiencing it in real life, I realized that all the theoretical modeling of spending 20 minutes two, three times a week with just arms and face exposure to sunlight would give you all the vitamin D you need. It's just simply not true for a lot of reasons. One reason, as we get older, we don't convert cholesterol into skin to vitamin D. You see, the sun, as it shines down on us, uh, the, the, the photons in the sunlight will activate a form of cholesterol in the skin and convert it into vitamin D. Pretty amazing how that works, okay? Uh, but here's, the, here's the, the key thing you need to know about this. That does not happen unless the sun is at least 45 degrees in the sky. I, in my book, Hello Healthy, I called it the sun shadow standard. Pretty proud of that catchy phrase. The sun shadow standard. You look at the sun, look at your shadow, and if your shadow is longer than you are tall, you're making essentially zero vitamin D, even if you're out in the sun four or five hours. Full body in a, in a, in a, in a swimsuit, essentially clinically insignificant amounts of vitamin D. So, see, that's important to know. Right, so, so that's, that's one of the things that never gets actually explained in these other studies or articles that say, oh, if you just get some sun exposure, you get vitamin D. Yeah, but in what world do people do that? 
Okay, the average person does not go out in the sun between, for any length of time, between 10 and 2 or 3 in the afternoon, right, when the sun is high in the sky. Right now, here in October, uh, or, uh, early November, uh, there's only about two hours of the day where you get any amount of vitamin D because the sun is low in the southern horizon, right? And so it very rarely, or very, for a few hours only, if that, it gets above 45 degrees. Okay, yes? Yeah, okay. See, my point entirely is that most people who, who care about that are not going to be outside at that time. Okay, so now, but uh, there's, see, let me be clear. There's many other valuable aspects of sunlight besides the ability to make vitamin D. I think one of the most important times to get sunlight is actually early morning. And there's a lot of uh, information about how early morning sunlight has that near infrared light that penetrates even coats and hats. Even if you're completely dressed and, and, and bundled up and wearing a hat, you get that near infrared uh, uh, waves deep into your body that activate your mitochondria to produce a tremendous amount of melatonin, which is anti-cancer, antiviral. Melatonin is one of the best antivirals you can use. And the best way to get melatonin, just spend half hour in the early morning sunlight every day. Preferably walking, by the way. That would be a good combination of sunlight, fresh air, and exercise. So, so there's, there's all kinds of principles that, that we need to consider, not just Vi uh, ultraviolet B radiation, which is middle of the day, which is, which is the only form that makes vitamin D. Okay, so, so the, 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 re the reason for bringing that up is that that's why most people, whether they live in Guam or Southern California, need to supplement vitamin D if they want to be optimal. It's either that or spend maybe 20 minutes out in the midday sun protecting your face Okay, but exposing your back and your legs or something to vitamin D. But here's the other problem. As we get older, we make very little vitamin D. So, so as we get older, uh, over age 60, 70, 80, we're, we're making very little vitamin D compared to what we used to when we were younger with the same exposure. The other thing is the darker our skin is, for those of you that are fortunate and have a better tan than I do, the darker your skin is, the less vitamin D you produce per minute exposed to the sun. So that's why if you, if you have very dark skin, like from Nigeria, you're going to need to be on the sun eight hours a day to get enough vitamin D. That's why the average person of a very deep, dark pigment skin is very vitamin D deficient. But the reality is we're all vitamin D deficient unless we supplement. Almost all. Okay, so we're getting to that. Okay, but, but here, here's my experience. Okay, so I've been checking almost everybody's vitamin D level for the last 24 years. And the average patient that I see needs about 10,000 units a day. Now, the reason I'm bringing up this is a, is a question, and I'll get to your question next, um, is that the, the new study that just came out from the Endocrine Society is trying to squash all that. They're basically saying, don't even test it. Okay, like, like if, if, if you don't know, you can't treat it. It's like, what? And they, they got really blasted by many, many doctors. And I have the, I have the, the articles. I mean, this, they really basically said, you're... Your recommendations basically didn't bring into account anything that we understand from science. It was really bad, and, and I would tend to agree. Now, this, this is a, f f I, have, I have the entire journal article. 40 pages. 40 pages published, published, published uh, in June 2024, Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism a highly respected journal, and, and, and the Endocrine Society is a highly respected medical society as well. But basically, you know, th there's actually some good things that they did here. The problem, the problem is what the take-home message was. 
the take-home message was published the same day in Medscape, which is one of the more popular online medical journals, June 3, 2024, it says, don't screen vitamin D. New Endocrine Society guideline. That was the main message that the average physician got. Now, um, in the, after a, a month later, when they realized that there was a huge backlash to this, a lot of doctors said, like, we're not going to follow your guidelines. We're just not going to follow them because they're ridiculous, right? Uh, and um, and so, so they were dealing that. And then one, one, of the, um, one of the doctors said, as part of that feedback, he said, I would like to remind all my fellow physicians that recommendations should be regarded just as that, a recommendation. As doctors, we can use guidelines and recommendations in our practice but if a new one is presented that does not make sense or would lead to harm based on our education and training, then we are not bound to follow it. Now, I agree with that. But see, that's not what happened during COVID. Somebody came out with a guideline, all of a sudden it was law, and you lose your, you lose your license for not following the guideline, which was against the law, by the way. Okay, the, the FDA had to basically got sued over what it said about ivermectin, right? It was trying to tell physicians that they should not prescribe ivermectin. And then later on, the lawyer said, oh, we never, we never said that, but they did, it clearly, right? And so the judge finally said, you have no right to tell physicians how to practice medicine. You are not in that role of authority. But see, they acted like they were. They acted like you were. And you know what? Almost the whole world accepted it. Expect that to come again. Expect that to come again. You had the CDC saying, what? What about the, the, the people who rented houses in L.A.? Remember what they were saying about that they had moratoriums on, you can't collect rent. What does the CDC, what authority does the CDC have to say that? None whatsoever. But yet, they got away with it. Okay? So we need to learn from these mistakes because it's coming again. Yes? Right, right. So anyways, so the, the, here's the problem with guidelines and why we should not just sit back and go like, oh, yeah, this is a guideline. I don't really need to follow it. I'm not bound to it, so I'm not going to make a big deal. I'm not going to be the contrarian. I mean, I feel the same way. I don't, I don't want to be a contrarian. But I've seen enough of this that I've realized that unless we raise an objection to that, pretty soon you don't have an option but to follow it. And what are the other consequences of this? If you want to get your vitamin D checked, which I hope you do, now insurance companies have a good reason to deny that. New Endocrine Society guideline, one of the most respected societies in the, in the, in the in medical field, and so we're not going to honor that order from your doctor. We're not going to pay for it because it doesn't follow the guidelines. Right? That's the consequences of allowing guidelines to go unchallenged. We should, and, and that's, we, should, we should be careful with that even in our own churches. If there's guidelines that aren't following what our fundamental beliefs say, if they're not following what, uh, uh, what, 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 is, what, we sh what, what we actually believe, then we should challenge those guidelines. Right? Okay, we're learning that there's, there's a consequence of not challenging unfounded guidelines. Okay, so, anyways, um, we, we, we want to be aware of that. Yes, sir, you had a question. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay, great question. So I'll repeat that for the video. Um, the, the, the range, of the, the quote toxic uh, or upper limit of, of the normal reference range for vitamin D 
is currently 100 nanograms per ml. If you're going by European standards, which is micromoles per liter, you have to multiply by two and a half. So it's 250 for them. Um, so um, bottom line, though, is that, first of all, the notion that if you're above the reference range that it's toxin is simply not true. See, and that's, and that's where it, what the rest of the first part of the, of the statement you made is totally true as well, where you had a whole bunch of fair-skinned rednecks going into the army and getting exposed to a lot of sun and their, their vitamin D levels go up to 200, or they might have supplemented, I don't know the story, but, but they were healthy. So, so Dr. Robert Heaney, who's the world's, well, he's passed away now from old age, but he was the world's leading authority in vitamin D. He was a medical a professor of medicine at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. And I had the privilege to attend his lectures and speak to him for quite a while back in uh, 2008, when that we had the very first conference on the utilization of vitamin D in clinical practice right here in San Diego at UCSD. And uh, so we had, we had a coming together of the world's leading researchers uh, on the topic. And I remember Dr. Madrid had written a book on vitamin D. He's a physician with Loma Linda Medical Center uh, in Marietta. He lives, he lives in Marietta. And he wrote a book on vitamin D that he wanted me to co-author. And I just didn't have time to write that or help him. But um, we actually went up to Dr. Robert Heaney, who's the world's leading authority, published hundreds of studies on vitamin D. And, and we asked him, well, how much vitamin D should, should we recommend as doctors for cancer patients? He said, well, how much cancer do you want to prevent? <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty interesting comment coming from like the world's leading expert on vitamin D. And, and so, so I asked him, I said, why is it that I said he sat on the, on the FDA Committee on Nutrition. He was one of the board members on that. And um, he said, uh, um, he had told us that they didn't, never approved his, his recommendations. And I said, I said why, why, would these, why would your committee, I mean, you're the world's leading expert on vitamin D, no question, why would your committee not even agree to your recommendations for vitamin D intake because he'd actually shown studies that no matter how much you're already taking, adding another 2,000 units of vitamin D a day would not be problematic. Now, that's in general, of course. His point was is that most people are not supplementing, or if they are supplementing, it's very little, very little. I just met with a patient in, in New Zealand, and... Um, He'd had cancer, and right now he's going through dementia. So I, I probably spend more time helping people with dementia than anything else because it's complicated, and you got to do everything. You can't just try this or that. you got to do everything, right? So, so uh, I asked him how much vitamin D he was taking. He goes, like, oh, I'm taking quite a bit. I go, like, oh, no, get the bottle and read it to me. <laughs> okay, and he says, um... Uh, 1,000 units a day. I go, like, you need to be on 10 times that. Not everybody needs 10 times that, but most of my patients do. I take 10 times that. I've been doing that for 20 years, and that keeps me right where I want to be, around 85. Right between 70 and 100 is the sweet spot, the upper third of reference. So reference is 30 to 100. Now, recently, in some labs, I have seen reference ranges come back that are below 80 or sometimes below 65 as the top end. And that is not based on science. That's based on somebody that doesn't want you to take vitamin D, in my opinion. And, and, and so uh, Dr. John Campbell, who has one of the most popular YouTube channels on health in the world, he's got this old professor of nursing. He's a, he's a PhD in nursing, and he's got, he still does uh, uh, overhead projector slides. <laughs> so he's like old, old time professor, but he's so wise. He's so wise. I didn't agree with him on a lot of things he said early on in the pandemic, but he, he repented and reformed, and I pretty much agree on everything he says now. 
And, but all along, he'd been pushing vitamin D. He, in fact, he had a little, he had a little dog with a little, a little dog on the, on the windowsill in the background of his video that had a, a sign that says, take vitamin D. Okay, so he was pushing that from the very beginning. And so that's what I appreciated about Dr. John Campbell. Um, uh, so uh, a bottom line is that uh, he just recently interviewed a doctor, Dr. Um, Angus Dalglish, who is considered to be, widely considered to be the top oncologist in Europe. He, he's, he's retirement age, but he's never going to retire because he just loves what he does so much. And he said, this just this past week, this, this is maybe one of the biggest reasons why you want to take vitamin D. He said, uh, we've been doing research on cancer therapeutics for 30 years. And we always scratched our head, why do some people get such a good response from our therapies and other people don't? until all of a sudden it became obvious what that reason was. This is coming from the world, one of the world's top oncologists. He says, we finally realized, much to our chagrin and embarrassment, that the number one predictor of whether you respond to cancer treatment is how high your vitamin D is. Sound familiar? And so he said, you want that level to be at least you want to get your blood levels at least to 100 micromoles per liter, which is the European standard. Divide that by 2.5, that means at least 40. Now, um, that would be the very least I would go for. The problem is, especially if somebody has cancer, or especially if somebody is at risk of cancer or other diseases, their vitamin D levels, if they're not supplementing, they're going to be under 20 sometimes under 10, and usually under 30, which are clearly deficient or insufficient. Okay, so, so, um, so, the, 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 so we determine what is best, not by, well, let's try this. We determine it based on all the collective research that we've looked at in our clinical experience and and then shoot for what is optimal, not what is minimally acceptable. See, there's, there's a problem in medicine, is that almost every standard in medicine is focusing on minimum acceptable, which means it's not optimal. Okay, so that's why in my books, I always say this is what the reference ranges are for all these blood tests, but this is what the optimal levels are. We strive for the optimal levels, not to be just barely in the semi-healthy range, right? Why would we strive to be just somewhat healthy? Yeah, that, and that's no good, especially if you miss that mark, right? You want to strive to be optimally healthy, yes? Okay, so the question is, if you're low on vitamin D, then, then what do you start at and how long do you do that? So I always say this, make your initial decision based on a test. So get a, see, uh, what a lot of people don't realize is that if your vitamin D level is under 30, we can actually write that as a diagnosis, low vitamin D. But if you start taking vitamin D first and then you check it, now we don't have any justification for saying you were low in vitamin D, even though you probably were, right? And so I don't know how insurances will cover it in the future because of this new guideline, okay? But at least historically, if your vitamin D is under 30, okay, we can actually use code E55.9, it's an ICD-10 code, and it will cover the, the cost of the medical test, okay? But never avoid a medical test that's a value simply because your insurance company won't pay for it. I mean, that is, you could say it's one of the definitions of insanity. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's like, just pay for it yourself. You know that you can actually order any blood test you want on your own, any. You can go through ultalabtest.com, 
Ulta, U-L-T-A, labtests.com, and you can order any lab test you want at a huge discount, like an 80, 90% discount from normal retail cost at a lab. See, if you, you, if you go to your doctor and you ask for a vitamin D test and they write it up for you, but you don't have the justification on the ICD-10 codes for that, or the insurance company just decides they're not gonna pay for it anymore, now you're charged 350 bucks at the lab. If you buy it yourself, it's like 40, 50 bucks. It's 550 now. What's that? I had it last week, it was 550. They did. That's, that's uh, highway robbery. They did that. You should not pay for it. Okay, so here, well, okay. So let me tell you what I tell patients. When a lab does that to you, see, most labs have to eat that, okay? So unless you sign something that says you will pay for whatever insurance doesn't cover, which is now they're doing more and more of it, you have no obligation to pay for it, okay, so unless you sign. Now, so if they ask you to sign something, then usually that suggests that they know it's not gonna be covered, which means pay for it yourself, don't do it through insurance, because instead of 550, it's 50, a lot cheaper. So I tell patients when, when there's a dispute with a lab, never pay the bill, address it first, and usually you can, you, you know, hospitals, uh, I mean, insurance agencies always are able to negotiate that bill down by uh, sometimes 80%. We should be able to too. Okay, so be aware of that. Uh, yes? What sort of symptoms are there, doctor, to identify if you're low? Okay, question, what about symptoms with low vitamin D? You know, the, the, the danger is to, is to only address it if you have symptoms. Remember, vitamin D is, you know, one of the first symptoms of uh, a vitamin D deficiency, a bad cold or flu. <laughs> right. Okay. You know, so so the, here's the problem. Vitamin D has to be converted to a, a, a hormone called 125 hydroxy vitamin D. OK. And that conversion takes about a week to uh, to occur. Actually, the initial conversion is to what you measure in the blood, which is 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And that's the type of vitamin D that destroys viruses, that activates your immune system to fight for you, it helps fight cancer. It's, it's a very powerful antimicrobial protein or peptide. So, so what you need to do here is um, you need to have that vitamin D on board at least a week early so that it's already now an activated form of vitamin D that quickly destroys viruses. Better than any antiviral you can get prescription, literally, better than any antibiotic that you can get by prescription because vitamin D is powerful antimicrobial. Okay, so, but you have to have it in your system and activate it and it takes days to a week to 10 days for that to happen. So that's why you never wait to take vitamin D until you're sick, you take it that's one of the recommendations that the Endocrine Society did, by the way, is take daily rather than occasional boluses. I agree with that. I don't, now, if, if you're sick, do a bolus. Do, do a, like a whole dropper full or do, do like 50,000 units all at once for a couple days. Why? Because your body's using up the vitamin D you've already created. need to replace that. Okay, so it's like, it's like you're in a war and you've run out of bullets and you need more bullets. Okay, so, uh, yes, sir. People have diabetes. What's your phone number? <laughs> uh, the easiest way to look up is uh, dryoungberg.com. All my contact information is there. I don't even carry cards anymore because it's all on my website. So dryoungberg.com, or you can just Google my name. You'll see my clinic. Yeah. And by the way, um, I, most of my visits are by Zoom. You can come to my clinic. It's not that, it's only 45 minutes away, okay, but but I see patients all over the country and world, so I use Zoom a lot. But I like to have people in front of me once in a while. So, yeah, uh, yes? Isn't depression a uh, symptom of low vitamin D? Yeah, so question, what about depression and low vitamin D? Yes, I have patients that tell me, wow, I started taking vitamin D, 
and my brain just felt so much clearer, and I was less depressed. I was better mood. Now it's not my it's not on my top ten list for depression, but it's on my top five list to treat for whatever the condition is. So we should always fix vitamin D no matter what because we all tend to be low. And when I say all, I mean like 98% guaranteed to be low unless you're supplementing. Okay, so okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over a couple more things. We'll take more questions as we go. Um, you know, here, here, here's a, one of the biggest things with COVID I mentioned earlier is that COVID is serious. COVID is serious. It's not, it's not just like the flu. Okay, COVID, you know, it, is, it was, it's basically a, a, the spike protein is toxic. It, and it was, it was designed in a lab. I mean, there, there's actually no question about that, so I'm not being political. There's no question about that. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, all the fat, that's one reason people don't trust the agencies anymore, because they flat out lied about that for years, and they're still acting like it's maybe still true. <laughs> so, but here's, here's why we know that. There was a researcher in 2021 that actually, actually uh, uh, looked at the spike protein and sequenced the spike protein Okay, and saw a really interesting sequence. There's a furin binding site on the spike protein that makes the spike protein much more likely to infect a cell. I mean, like, exponentially more likely to, to infect a cell. And so they're going like, whoa, this is a really unique segment of the spike protein. And, of course, the, 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 th the thought was is that this just happened in nature, that this just evolved over time. It's impossible for that to evolve over time. It would have taken thousands and thousands of years, if, if that, for that to occur. This is clearly a lab-designed lab virus, no question. Okay, anybody that knows anything about that just knows that that's true. Okay, so the, the, the question is like, whoa, so then why was this designed? And so this, this, do this doctor researcher <laughs> I, 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 in fact, Dr. John Campbell uh, interviewed him a couple months ago, and he said that they, they, he, he basically did, a, did a, a, a computer search that researchers do. It's a real in-depth computer search where they put in the sequence of the amino acids on the spike protein to see if this comes up anywhere. And you know where it came up? It was already patented, which means... There's no question that it was designed because it was already patented. Okay, so they actually sat on that for almost a year because they was just too hot to touch. They didn't want to lose their jobs. They sat on it for a year and then they finally published it. It's in the medical literature. Not, not many people are talking about that. So here's the point. Spike protein from the infection is extremely toxic. It's extreme. So in other words, prevent it from happening in the first place. I'm not talking about masks, because masks, let's just face it, the data is very clear, masks don't work for viruses. So where, wherever that idea came from, it's not true. Now, but let, me, let me just tell you, I was part of the problem initially. When I first heard about this killer virus, you know, and that tens of millions of people were gonna die, and that was all fear-mongering, because that wasn't true. Uh, but you know what I did? I was an early adopter. I pay attention, right? So I bought into the lie, the misinformation that was coming out of the University of London, coming out of uh, Los Alamos Laboratory, coming out of Johns Hopkins University, that was saying that tens of millions of people are going to die. So I'm thinking, what are we going to do about this, right? So you know what I did? I was the first one to start wearing masks. I was wearing an N99 mask, <laughs> full face. Okay, I mean, I, I was walking around. Nobody else was wearing. I would go out and go, go, go shopping. I didn't care what people thought because I was going to protect myself from this killer virus, right? <laughs> and, uh, and then I, I'd go to the bank, and then I, I read that there was some concern that some of these killer viruses could spread through aerosol to eyes, could infect you through the eyes. So I go like, okay. So I was like, well, I, you know, I, until I verify that or figure this out, I'm going to wear a fireman's mask. 
I kid you not. So I'm, 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 I'm um, doing a little self-deprecation to help you understand that I'm not being political about this. I just want what's true. Okay? And so until I figured out what was true, I was like, I wasn't taking any chances, right? So, so I don't blame people for wearing a mask because they think that that's going to protect them. Problem is, it doesn't protect you. So instead, do something that does protect you. That's my point. Right? I'm not trying to be political. I just want you to do what's best for you. Right? So, so I walk into a bank. We had six feet separation and the guards were letting us one at a time. And, and so I, 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 was, I was basically um, had to go meet with a banker at a desk. And I'm wearing N99 mask. I'm wearing a, I'm wearing a, gog, a fireman's goggles. You know, I'm, I'm good. You know, I'm protected. You know, and, um, and so I go sit down and and the banker, she leans over to me. And she says, like, man, I wish we could wear that, but they won't let us. <laughs> well, a couple months later, they're forcing them to, to wear stuff that would possibly help them. I mean, maybe what I was wearing, maybe that would help a little bit, you know, if, if there was such a problem. But most of the virologists at the time were saying trying to contain a virus is like trying to hold back the wind. And then even they changed their tunes because somebody got to them. Okay, all right. So, um, so this. So, what do we do? What do we do? Okay. So, the. Um, I'm going to. By the way, it's it's almost four o'clock. Um, I can I can go all night. <laughs> no, I'm not I'm not going to do that. But uh, don't you know? Many of you have children to be with. Uh, whatever. Whatever. Feel free to leave at any time. We're kind of doing some Q&A in between statements here. I have some other things I want to share with you. I also want to share a little bit with you about iodine because that's really important. Those are the two things that every household should have on hand. But I want to finish this section of vitamin D real quick because vitamin D, charcoal, and iodine are three of the key things that you should never ha have be without. Um, back in January, February of 2020, in addition to teaching my church, my church members, fellow members, uh, how to do hydrotherapy, uh, our, our senior pastor said, Wes, would you do a 10-minute segment right before my sermon? Right, right where everybody got everybody's attention, everybody's sitting down, you know, the kids are less restless, and, and do a 10-minute segment on something that's really critical to protect their immune system. I said, absolutely, right? And so what I did, our clinic, gave every family a bottle of liquid vitamin D in the entire church. Everybody got one. And I explained to them, I said, this, and back then there was no research on COVID and vitamin D. No research at all. Okay, but I knew that it was going to work. Why? Because I know the medical literature and viruses respond very well to an immune system that's primed with vitamin D. Two years later, we learned that in the, at the height of Delta, at the height of Delta, individuals who came down with Delta, who, uh, who had major complications, right? Comorbidities, right? Obesity, diabetes, etc. You know, they're the ones that are dying like flies, right? Okay. But not if their vitamin D was above 50. If your vitamin D was above 50 nanograms per uh, ml, your risk of dying of Delta COVID, even if you were severely obese and diabetic, etc., was essentially zero. Okay? That was the unconscionable part of the public health system knew that, or should have known that. The literature was very clear on that. And yet did nothing about, it. you know, there was a, I saw an article, an email that Dr. Fauci had sent where he took 6,000 units a day. Allegedly that he, he had written that to somebody that he took 6,000 a day. Well, why don't you tell the rest of the world to do that too? But they had decided that that would go against the narrative and decrease and increase vaccine hesitancy. That's what they had decided. Uh, so, so, and I think that's 
that shows very, very low integrity. All right, now, um, so here's a, here's a study way before COVID ever hit, and COVID caused all these autoimmune diseases, right? Whether it was an infection or whether it was the vaccine, it promoted anything with spike protein, promoted autoimmunity, among other things, blood clotting, a whole bunch of problems. Okay, so um, this, this uh, remember this 11-year-old girl in Mexico City got diarrhea after her mom had COVID, and their only symptom was diarrhea, and then she got type 1 diabetes. Okay, and so the key is that that's, of course, an autoimmune condition. Now here, if she had had vitamin D above 50 nanograms per ml as an 11-year-old girl, I can predict with a high level of certainty that she would have never gotten type 1 diabetes. And let me explain. Let me explain why I believe that. Okay. So uh, th there was a study published in 2001 based on, on a, a very large cohort study of 12,000 individuals that were tracked in the uh, country of Finland. Um, and, um, and they were actually uh, encouraged to take vitamin D, about 2,000 units daily. These are pregnant women that were going to that we're gonna uh, give birth in 1966. Man, I'm so proud of them for doing this study. They were really on it. 1966, I was six years old at the time. Okay, and, uh, and so they enrolled these 1,200 individuals, the pregnant women, during that time, and they kept track of whether they were following the advice or not, right? They had a really good uh, tracking system. In fact, most countries in Europe have a much better tracking system than we do in the US. I mean, much, much better than what we do. So this is a really interesting study. And what they did is they followed these, these live births for 31 years. It wasn't a short study, long study. And the main endpoint of the study was how many of these individuals develop type 1 diabetes in a country that has the very highest prevalence of type 1 diabetes in the world. And you know why epidemiologists, epidemiologists okay, it's getting late, um, uh, say that that is because they have very little sun exposure and therefore very little vitamin D. Okay, and if you're not supplementing vitamin D, especially in that latitude, you're in trouble. You're in trouble in all kinds of ways. So they did this study, and they found, they found that the children who had developed rickets during the first year of life were 300% more likely to get type 1 diabetes than the children who did not get rickets. And why do you get rickets? Because of low vitamin D. That's why you get rickets. Okay? So, uh, but, but more interestingly... They found that, that of those who got, those children that were documented, that during the first 10 years of life, they were getting about 2,000 units of vitamin D regularly on a daily basis. Okay, they ended up having a 88, excuse me. Yeah, they had a 78% lower risk of developing type 1 diabetes during that 31-year period. In other words, the children who did not take the vitamin D at 2,000 units daily, okay, they were essentially five times more likely to develop type 1 diabetes. That study came out in 2001. Why do not our guidelines use this information? How many type 1 diabetics are there? We know that even type 2 diabetes is strongly related to this. So, and, and you know what really saddened me the most about this? I was so proud of Finland for doing that study. But you know, after the study was completed, 
they had the option to continue recommending as a public health service 2,000 units per child, which is the bare minimum in my opinion. Okay, and yet, you know what they did instead? They said, you know what? We're just gonna do what the Americans do. Yes, that, you know what? The Americans promote 600 units a day. Not gonna work. I mean, it's better than nothing. You know, but it's like, it's like having half a glass of water per day compared to the eight glasses you really need, right? It's better than nothing. It's not adequate. Okay, so that's, that was very important. Um, okay, I'll, another study just came out a couple months ago showing that if you have enough vitamin D uh, and, you, and, you, and you actually get diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, if you start taking vitamin D, it extends the honeymoon period, which means the, 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 the time where your body still, your pancreas is still able to make insulin, somewhat. Okay, so, so that's, that, that's a big, big improvement, lowering complications. Here's a study published last year showing that if, you, if you, those people who took vitamin D were 40% likely to develop dementia. There, there was... Um, there was another study in 2006 published by the Journal of Alzheimer's. And they showed in a big population study that if your vitamin D was deficient, you were 125% more likely to develop dementia than those that, were, that were, uh, had, more adequate, had more adequate vitamin D level in their blood. That very same year, the same month that that article came out in the Journal of Alzheimer's, a, a doctor wrote, wrote an op-ed piece in one of the internal medicine journals saying, you know, there's really no good evidence that we should be testing vitamin D or supplementing it. Now, again, I've, I've, I've experienced this over 25 years, and I've seen these, these op-ed pieces, these opinion pieces come up over and over again, always slamming vitamin D. And, and, I, and I'm keeping like, what, what, what motivation would somebody have to tell people not to test vitamin D? And to say that there's no data when there's hundreds of studies saying otherwise. Okay, and um, um, it was Dr. John Campbell again, uh, um, Amazing man with courage. You know, it seems to be that the retired physicians and the retired researchers and the retired uh, doctors of other professions, they're the ones that are most likely to tell you the truth. So maybe if you, for you to believe me, I just need to retire, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, 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 it's fascinating because they're not afraid of losing their job. Top researchers out of Yale University you know, they're, they're speaking out. Why? Because nobody can fire. They're retired. Okay, but if somebody's concerned about their job, they oftentimes lay low. Okay, but that's, that's very dangerous in times like this. So Dr. Campbell, just in the last week, actually, he said, what would happen if everybody repleted their vitamin D adequately? In other words, everybody took at least 2,000 or more, more likely, at least my typical patient would need about 5,000 units. That's been my experience over 25 years. Pretty much everybody I see, no matter why I see them, when I test them, they're going to be low and they need at least 5,000 units a day. And that's never going to be too much. Dr. Robert Haney said you would never go toxic unless you're taking over 30,000 a day. Now, your, your blood levels may go higher than you need, and that's, I always guide, I go by that guide. I, so if somebody's taking vitamin D and their blood levels go over 100 nanograms per, mil, in, per milliliter, then I say, let's, let's adjust this back down and retest it in four or five months. So you always test in the spring and you test in the fall. If you've never checked your vitamin D, check it right now. This is the highest vitamin D you're going to have in the year. Why? Because it's after the summer, right? Uh, so check in the fall, supplement, check again in the spring, adjust, 
And then after a couple of years of checking it twice a year, you can pretty much know what the right level is for you. I, mean, I would still check it once a year. Why? Because, you know, the human, the human tendencies are to forget what is good for us unless we test. Unless we test. Yes? Okay, the question is, what about somebody who has an autoimmune condition like rheumatoid arthritis? Um, then, again, all the more reason why you want to optimize your vitamin D. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying somebody with rheumatoid arthritis for years is going to reverse that in any way if you take vitamin D. However, you'll be healthier. You'll be healthier, and your immune system will be much more effective, and you'll have less autoimmunity than you otherwise would. Okay, so, you know, I always check out of me markers on every patient because I want to look at the early indications or predispositions for autoimmunity. And therefore, uh, and what do we do for autoimmunity? Optimize the omega-3 fats, like, like the, the EPA and DHA. You got everybody's low on that unless you're eating a lot of fish, which I don't recommend because of the toxins. Okay, or you're supplementing with a microalgae omega-3. Okay, so, so optimize that, optimize your antioxidants, E, C, et cetera, et cetera and then um, optimize uh, vitamin D and optimize DHEA sulfate, which is one of the hormones from the adrenals and the ovaries. Uh, Omega-3, on average, 1,000 milligrams of DHA daily, which means you're also getting more EPA on top of that. But that, so that would be an average. I test every patient, what's called the omega check. So that measures your red blood cell uh, levels of EPA and DHA. And don't think that just by eating chia and flaxseed, you're gonna optimize that. You won't. Those are healthy fats. I like them, I use them, but they won't increase your EPA, DHA. They can convert a little bit, but very little. So you need the actual EPA, DHA supplementally unless you eat fish. By the way, where do the fish get it? They eat the microalgae. So you, either you eat microalgae or you eat pure, clean fish, which is easier said than done. Okay? Jesus ate clean fish. I have no problem with that. Okay? Problem is... 40 years ago, I went to a Surf Rider Foundation meeting, lecture, and, and they were telling us about how toxic the fish were all around the U.S. And, and I said, well, you know, we're telling people to move away from red meat, uh, uh, eat less chicken, eat more fish, right? That was the kind of the standard public health recommendation. And he said, I would not recommend people eat fish more than once a month, if that. And that was 40 years ago. Okay, so um, I'm not against people eating fish, okay? You know, um, it's like we say, you do you, right? But you got to understand that all fish have toxins in them or viruses or parasites, etc. So you got you to you you understand that side of it. Uh, uh, yes, back here. Okay, the t what type of vitamin D is best? The bottom line, take it, okay, right? That's the number, first and foremost, make sure you take it. Now, most of the medical guidelines historically, uh, if you got a prescription for vitamin D, it was ergocalciferol, which is the, the quote, vegetarian form of vitamin D. Um, but that has to be converted to cholecalciferol in the body. Okay, so I prefer personally using a vegan form of cholecalciferol, vegan form of vitamin D3, um, and, and even the non-vegan forms are still good, but most of them come from lanolin. So they come from the sheep's wool. So when they express the sheep wool, vitamin D comes off of it. Why is that? Because where does vitamin D come from? It comes from exposure of skin to sunlight 
and it turns into this waxy, oily substance in the skin, and then it oozes into the, the wool, and when the wool is sheared, you can get vitamin D off of it. That's called lanolin form. So it's technically not vegetarian, but, you know, that's like eating honey, you know, that's like eating pollen. It's really not a problem, in my opinion. Now, I would caution people just to get vitamin D from anywhere, the regular vitamin D3, because I had a, I had a old farmer came up to me after a lecture years ago, maybe 15 years ago, and he says, um, you know, I have a farm, and every once in a while I see a truck full of pig heads rolling into a vitamin D factory. So what are they extracting vitamin D from? Pig brains. Okay, so that doesn't sit very well with me. Uh, but so that's why I personally use a vegan option. It's, it's, it's basically an ergocalciferol. It's, it's a vegetable vitamin D2 that's been converted into laboratory to D3. So it's like a bioidentical T, D3. It's the same thing. Yes? Uh, you don't have to, but I recommend it. <laughs> so, so the, but it should be a vitamin K2, MK7. Okay, so that's 180. You should get at least 100 micrograms of vitamin K2, MK7 a, a day with your vitamin D. I personally take 360 milligrams. Uh, I, I use a vitamin D that has 5,000 D3 in it and 180 K2 MK7 in one capsule, and I take two capsules a day. That's, that's the easiest way to get both of those. But you should also get magnesium. You should also get a little bit of vitamin A along with that. Yes? What was your original vitamin D? What was your original level? Did they check it? Well, just tell me. Yeah. Okay, so it was right around 21, and then it ended up being about 20, 29. Okay, so I consider both of those to be inadequate. Yeah. I mean, technically, you go from deficiency under 20 to, to insufficiency under 30, and there's different definitions. To me, well, the only thing that matters is what should it be. Exactly. You know, so you can have all these uh, definitions that don't really mean anything. You, you want, you're, you're way too low. You should be at least above 50. Okay, so, so the, the bottom line on vitamin D is this, and then we'll talk about iodine for a little bit and, and then take some more questions if you wish. The bottom line on vitamin D is uh, in 2021, I, I mentioned that if the vitamin D was above 50, right, that there would be zero risk of dying of COVID. That's the bottom line. So, so that's why I say you should at least be above 50, okay, but preferably above 70, but under 100, so in that range. Okay, so, but don't worry, if your vitamin D is above 100, a lot of doctors say that's toxic. That's not true at all. Okay, the, the research says if your level is above 100, it could be toxic. Which means if it hits like 250, it's, it could be toxic. Yeah, so 250 is above 100, but 100 is not toxic. Dr. Robert Haney himself told us, that your blood levels have to be above 250 for a prolonged amount of time before they are toxic. And by that, it means it's just kind of bad for you, like something that's not good for you. It's not going to kill you. Nobody's ever died from vitamin D excess, even though a big report came out earlier this year from Europe saying that it was determined that it was caused by vitamin D deficiency, and it was just simply not true. I looked at that study very carefully, and they said it, but it wasn't true, okay? 
so yes. Back off. Well, most people who take 10,000 units never get above 100. Okay, so the, again, we need to individualize this for each person. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the age of personalized care, precision care. So don't go by what, what just what studies say for the average person. Figure out what's right for you, which requires you testing. Okay, so, so in my experience, the average person, to get their blood levels, like in your case, you know, you should take 10,000 until proven otherwise. How do you prove otherwise? You recheck it after six months. Okay, and if they won't check it, check it yourself. Go on ultalabtest.com, check it yourself. Okay, so, so don't, you know, we, we need to start taking personal responsibility for pretty much all our Medicare, our medical care, and, and of course, work with doctors that can help you uh, with that process as well. Um, okay. Vitamin C on mold? Okay, so that, that's a whole other topic. Uh, you, you're actually very correct. Uh, if people that have exposure to mold, uh, need, need a lot more antioxidants. Why? Because antioxidants will, will deactivate mycotoxins. It'll deactivate a lot of toxins. It even deactivates viral toxins. Viruses are toxic as well, of course, as we know. So, so yeah, so, you know, vitamin C is really important. You know, the, for instance, Dr. Linus Pauling, who, who, who was literally reported to be the smartest man in the world while he was alive, at least scientist. Uh, many, many who knew him and, of his, and, and, and worked with him said he was smarter than Einstein. Okay, he was just brilliant. He, of course, he was one of the only two-time Nobel laureates, but he's the one that came out with a very strong uh, uh, encouragement for people to take lots of vitamin C, which he was vilified by doctors that I knew back, back in the 80s and 90s. He was vilified by them uh, because they said it was quacker, quackery, right? But who are you going to believe, you know, the smartest scientist in the world or some physician that thinks he knows better, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. I mean it's, an easy, it's an easy answer. And so Dr. Pauling, he recommends that people take lots of vitamin D throughout the day and here's why, because the average animal our size produces about 4,000 milligrams of vitamin D a day throughout the day, 24-7. How do they do that? They have an enzyme that converts glucose, blood sugar, into vitamin C. Vitamin C is almost identical to glucose as a, as a chemical structure. That's why if you measure your, your, your glucose with a continuous glucose monitor, they tell you don't take too much vitamin C because that monitor picks up vitamin C as glucose, even though it's not. So it's, it's the problem with the monitor, not vitamin C turning into glucose, right? Okay, so, um, so we as humans do not have that enzyme. We're missing it. Don't know why. But we're one of the few animal, mammals that do not convert glucose to vitamin C. And so Linus Pauling used the kind of an evolutionary argument, which I disagree with, but I, I believe the outcome of his argument, and that is if animals our size produce that much vitamin C, then it would be reasonable for us to take that vitamin C as well. Yeah. So, so we're supplying the body what otherwise we can't provide it. It's protection, especially under today's toxic environment. So, so what about if we're sick, though? This is important for the immune system. What if we're sick? An animal our size who becomes sick 
will start producing an average of 20,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day until it's well again. Should that somehow change our attitude about vitamin C intake? Now, I don't want to, I don't want to get off on a tangent here, but I also want to speak what's true. It sounds quackish. I realize that. It sounds uh, unjustified uh, pseudoscience. I get that. But I defer to one of the smartest men who ever lived. Okay? That's how I look at it. Okay? I go by the Mavericks, not by the committees. Okay? So, so that's, that's why we want to optimize our vitamin C. Uh, Pardon me? Okay. I was wondering if somebody was going to ask that question. <laughs> you know, I, I, gave a, I gave a seven hours of lectures at the Ukaipa Church five, months, five weeks ago. Not one person asked me that question. So I didn't answer it. Uh, but, um, okay, so let's, uh, I did a lecture in Fallbrook two weekends ago on optimizing the immune system. So what I didn't cover today was, is covered in that lecture. You can watch it on YouTube at the Fallbrook Seventh Adventist Church YouTube channel. And in that, in that lecture, I actually, I talk about Dr. Redfield, I talk about Dr. So well, let, let me just answer your question. The question is, was the COVID vaccine a problem? Or, or, or was, it, was it increasing pro, uh, health risk? Short answer is absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I know that as clearly as I know anything. And I know there's a lot of doctors aren't willing to say that. But that's just because they're just not willing to say it. Okay, either that, either they're, either they're ignorant, which I don't believe is true, because I think most doctors are very smart, okay, or they just don't want to hear about it. They don't want to go there, okay? Because it's, it's a very politically tense issue. And, and science should not be politically uh, uh, manipulated. Unfortunately, it is. Okay? But we just need to stand for what is true. That's my, my only motivation is what's right. Okay? So when, when I first started studying the COVID vaccine in, in early 2020, you know, based on the original research that had been done on animals, and I was reading about huge groups of animals dying because of the vaccine. I'm going like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Okay, there's a reason why that was skipped with the new research on COVID, you know, uh, the, the, the COVID-2, right? There's a, there's a reason why they skipped that part of the research, because the research would not have come out very good, most likely. Okay, so the... Um, uh, so I, of course, I didn't know what the truth was at the time. I just was concerned, right? I was concerned. The early, early research was not very good. And that's why they said there was never going to be a good vaccine against the coronavirus because all the research ended up with devastating results. So the, the whole idea that they went ahead and did research on that because was like kind of went against the common narrative of the time. And... Um, and so then I listened to the interviews with the top vaccinologists. See, I, I'm willing to listen to anybody who has an opinion as long as you can back up your opinion somehow, right? Because I want to learn what, what, what the facts are, right? So, so Dr. Um, uh, Paul Olfit, who's one of the top vaccinologists in the country, he's a pediatrician, he sits on the FDA advisory committee on vaccines. So I wanted to hear what he had to say. He was being interviewed by the chief editor of the Journal of American Medical Association. This is October of 2020, right in the middle of Operation Warp Speed, which was a disaster in my opinion. Okay, again, I'm not being political. I'm just, I mean, both sides really made huge mistakes on this. Okay, and, and um, you know, they work operating at the speed of science, Really? <laughs> right? Okay. That means, you mean skipping all the steps you're supposed to follow when you do good science. That's what actually was the reality of operating at the speed of science. They basically neglected science in doing those studies. 
Okay, so, and again, I'm a public health expert, right? That's, that's, that's my basic, you know, specialty is public health. Okay, and that's where we really miss the boat is with public health. Uh, and then, unfortunately, most medical doctors followed suit after that. They didn't ask the questions. So, um, so, the, so Dr. Paul Olfit, as being interviewed, he was very concerned about what might happen with antibody-dependent enhancement, which means that the vaccine would stimulate the production of an antibody that instead of neutralizing the antigen, you know, the, the spike protein, actually help the spike protein infect a cell. That's antibody-dependent enhancement. He was raising that question back then. Why? Because their early research had showed that was ha that's what happened. So I'm going like, well, this guy's definitely got to vote against it, but he voted for it just like everybody else. Now, the reason I brought this up is that as of last year, he was no longer recommending the booster. So we got a new booster out right now, right? And, and I had... Um, I had a patient from Yukaipa that heard my lecture on treating dementia. So he signed up, he, 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 he scheduled an appointment with me for two weeks later. He came in to see me and I was doing the workup. He tells me, oh yeah, I just, I just had the booster. I wish somebody like you had asked that question at Yukaipa. So he wouldn't have done it if he had asked somebody to ask that question. Because even Dr. Paul Wolf is saying, don't do any more boosters, other than in rare situations. Okay? And, and Dr. Robert Redfield, past director of the CDC, is saying, I would never give an mRNA vaccine. I mean, he did. He took one himself. Okay, but he won't do it anymore. Why? Because he has enough evidence to see it's not a good idea. Right? So don't just take my word for it. That's why I, I quote these other experts that were on one side initially, and now they're saying we made a horrible mistake. But most health professionals are still not willing to admit it. That's the problem. Why is it a problem? I have some, I have some people say, you know, Wes, just get over it, man. Just let it go. I go like, what do you mean? People are dying. People are still getting boosters when the, the evidence is clear that it's bad for them. We need to take a stand on this. Uh, uh, Dr. Paul Lundgren, the top vaccinologist in the country, okay, he, oh, I'm sorry, hey! <laughs> Boy, okay, that's not a Freudian slip. <laughs> Paul Olfit, sorry about that. Okay, Olfit, O-F-F-I-T. Okay, uh, edit that out, would you? <laughs> okay. okay, but at least, at least you're on the right side of that one, right? Uh, okay, so uh, he, he, now, you know, again, he's not against vaccines. He's just saying, if you've got COVID, natural immunity is far better than any vaccine ever could be, right? That was another big, big problem over the last few years that was not recognized, even though anybody with any scientific background knew that to be a fact. Okay, the other thing, it's not about antibodies, it's about how many T cells you generate. It's the T cells that are more important for your immunity than antibodies as well. So there's all kinds of reasons why natural immunity is better. Remember, COVID infection is still a risk. I'm not denying that in any way. Okay, and that's why we need to optimize our immune system ahead of time so we're ready for the next surge that likely is coming in the next months and uh, through the winter. Uh, do top doctors in Europe and other places are expecting a big surge. And I'm not fear mongering here, I'm just saying we gotta be ready just in case. And I, I suspect that that's what's gonna happen. Why? It's, it, the answer to why goes back to a study that the Cleveland Clinic did. The Cleveland Clinic was basically forced financially to mandate the vaccine. How do I know that? Because I have friends who work for the Cleveland Clinic and they told me Cleveland Clinic did not want to mandate the vaccine, but they were told by the federal government and Medicare, if you don't mandate the vaccine, we will not pay you anything we owe you. 
which is 80% of most corporate medical budgets, comes from the government. That's a problem. That's a huge problem. So they mandated it, but they still had 25% of the population, just like in general, 25% of the U.S. population said no. Not going to happen, no matter what. Not going to happen. Okay, so 25% of Cleveland Clinic employees age 18 to 64 uh, 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 basically said, no, I'm not going to do it no matter what you do to me. Okay, the rest took the initial series, typically Pfizer, okay, and then they tracked how many boosters they got. And here's what they found. This is directly from the Cleveland study um, that was published in a peer-reviewed paper. And... Uh, um, and it was done by the experts in infectious disease and biostatistics. This is a well-done paper, Cleveland Clinic, the second most elite clinic in the world, next to Mayo Clinic, right? And so uh, uh, they found that for every single COVID vaccine used by their employees, it increased the risk of future COVID infections by 100%. Okay, now just think about that for a second. That's completely opposite from everything that we've been told for the, even still. Completely, and they're not the only study that showed that. Okay, so, so, so the Cleveland Clinic, by the way, you can see all this on the, if you watch the Fallbrook SDA Church uh, YouTube presentation I gave two weeks ago. Um, so, so for in other words, if you had the two initial series and then you had a booster or two, you were over 300% more likely to get COVID later on. So even if there is, per se, possibly a little bit of protection for a little bit of time, the real issue is what's the long-term complication? That is a deal breaker. That, that means that what's happening is causing immune dysfunction. It's causing acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Okay, I'm, I, the, the, I, I'm, this is not hyperbole. That's the definition of AIDS is when you have something causing immune deficiency. It doesn't have to be HIV. It can be anything. And so something that's causing immune deficiency is bad news. It's bad news. So that's why, you know, I, it, it's, again, I don't want to be a contrarian. I don't, uh, but I, I'm, I think time is short. Amen. I want to be able to live with my conscience. Amen. I don't want to go home and not worry about what people think about me politically because I chose not to say anything. Because if I do that, I'm going to have a hard time living with myself. So, you know, do your own research, right? I'm just telling you that I've been researching this every day since, since uh, early 2020, when they were first starting to look at it. And I'm convinced of this as much as I'm concerned about anything about diabetes or vitamin D or whatever. Okay, so for whatever it's worth, you know, pay attention to that. So Dr. Paul Olfit, Okay, Dr. Robert Redfield is saying, don't do those mRNA vaccines. Now, now to be fair to Dr. Paul Olfit, he's, he's just saying you don't need the boosters anymore. He's, he's not suggesting that the original series was a bad idea. Okay, I'm just saying it was a bad idea based on my understanding. Okay, so, um, so in other words, you have a right to make your own choice. There should be informed consent. And that was another big, big problem with his entire public health campaign. There was no informed consent whatsoever. That goes against all the principles of medical ethics. Low integrity. So way too many things happened that, that proved low integrity in the entire system. In other words, it's not just the agencies that are captured. It's the universities. It's the it's the medical centers, it's the hospitals, it's, the, it's even the clinics and many of the doctors. And so we, we all need to just take a stand for what's true. Okay, yes? Would you say that you're pretty much in harmony with Dr. Peter McCullough? 
You know, uh, so, so the question is, am I in harmony with Dr. Peter McCullough? I have great respect for Dr. Peter McCullough. Here's an, you know, I have, you know, he's an amazing, amazing scientist. Probably the most, the most uh, published cardiologist in the world. And he's a conventional cardiologist through and through. He wasn't trained like I was. And uh, he wasn't trained in, in preventive care and preventive medicine and lifestyle medicine. He had no experience in functional medicine whatsoever. And yet, he was humble enough and intuitively wise enough to instantly see when he saw his patients in his clinic, we need to have a better system. We can't just tell people to go home and take Tylenol. I mean, that was unconscionable, right? So he immediately started scoring, uh, just looking at the research. There's all kinds of research on how to treat viral infections. This whole idea that you can't treat, that we didn't have a good antiviral, just a big fat lie. There's all kinds of things. Iodine, you know, in, in 1918, remember what happened then? Uh, the Spanish flu. Hydrotherapy worked. Rest worked. Uh, yeah, basically, not basically really, really, really resting. There's a whole bunch of stuff you'll see on the other uh, presentation. Okay, but researchers, governments all around the world started really studying, like, we don't want this ever to happen again. What do we do? 25 years of research after the Spanish flu epidemic in, in 1918, researchers came to a conclusion. They said that the best way to treat viruses that are aerosolized, like COVID or respiratory viruses of any kind, is with iodine. And there's been study after study after study on that. If you want to, if you want to see a full hour presentation that I did on just iodine, go to Rumble and just type in my name. You'll see a seven part series I did for Daniel Vieira Health and Healing Crusade last April. And all the seven parts, I, I did that in one day. We just videotaped for seven hours straight. Because as you know, I got a lot of material and that's how long it took to get through it. Okay. So, and so we divided it up into seven sections and one section, the last section is all things iodine. And I have all the studies. This isn't just some idea I came up with, you know, that it pulled out of some alternative medicine journal and that is not scientific. This has been published over and over and over again. We've known about this for 100 years. And yet the fact checkers back in 2021 uh, and 2022 were saying, we're, we're, we're vilifying anybody that promoted iodine because said, oh, we use that in the ER to get rid of bacteria, but iodine isn't an antiviral, so it couldn't treat a virus. And I'm going like, you know, th this is like the director of ER for a major medical center saying this and, and being quoted in a journal. And I'm going like, he's completely clueless. He has no idea what he's talking about. All he had to do is go on Google for two minutes and he would have found out he was wrong. But he didn't want to, apparently. Okay, so uh, iodine has been, is, it will kill any virus. It'll kill Ebola, it'll kill HIV, it'll kill... Marburg virus will kill any virus if it's in contact with the virus. And so that's why you want to use the iodine sprays. You want to use the iodine nebulizers. And, and um, what you can do also is get regular betadine, which is different than all the other iodines. All the other iodines that I use that you'll see on the lecture are nutritional iodine. Betadine is not nutritional iodine. Povidone iodine, which betadine is a brand name of, um, is not nutritional iodine. That's the red stuff that you put on wounds, you know, that, that ERs use and doctors' clinics use to, you know, when they're suturing you up, they put betadine on there to make sure you're not going to get infected. But that's not for internal use. However, you can dilute it 20 to 1, gargle and swish with it for 30 seconds, squirt it up into your sinuses. If you get COVID or any respiratory infection, 
on day one of your exposure or infection, just do that four times a day, and you'll knock that out in two days, three days max. You'll knock it out. I had patients coming up to me and says, I'm flying internationally in four days, and, I've, and I, I tested positive for COVID. What do I do? I said, just use iodine for three days, and I guarantee you, you'll 95% chance you'll test negative for COVID. And it worked every time that I ever tried it. That would be 20 to 1, yes. Yeah. That my, 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 my lecture will go through that and give you more e easy conversions. So you watch, so, so you just, just go to rumble.com, type in my name, you'll see that entire lecture. I, have, I had a seven part series called The Rise of Immune Dysfunction, Blood Clotting, uh, uh, Autoimmunity, Diabetes, and Dementia, Post COVID Infection, and Post COVID Vaccine. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> uh, okay, all right. Um, uh, we're winding down here. Uh, it's, been, it's been a very lively discussion. And um, uh, again, you can leave at any time. <laughs> uh, are there any, any final questions that people want to ask? Yes, ma'am. Well, let me answer that one first. The name of the books are, number one is Goodbye Diabetes, How to Naturally Reverse Type 2 Diabetes and Insulin Resistance. That, there's a whole story behind that one. Uh, it was commissioned by a philanthropist, well, Tom Zapara, okay, who, who, who was very concerned, wanted to, a, a definitive work on reversing diabetes developed, and he harassed his publisher who, who he, was on, he was chairman of the board, okay, and who then harassed me for five years until it was done. So that's how that happened. It was very well written. I had a, a co-writer that was amazing, very well done. Uh, the second book is Hello Healthy, okay, which is basically the 12 strategies most important for health and healing. Okay, and then the, the last book is Memory Makeover, the how to reverse cognitive decline and prevent Alzheimer's naturally. Okay, so yeah, those are the three books. And the follow-up question? You mentioned earlier today about, you do work with non-smoking. Do you have a non-smoking plan? Or do you have okay, the, the question is, do I work with people trying to quit smoking? And a absolutely, I can help people do that. It's part of a broader perspective. So I, what I do is I do comprehensive lifestyle medicine. And so if somebody comes in, they want to stop smoking. First of all, why do people smoke? Right? I mean, people smoke because it does something for them, right? It's, it's, there's a reason why people smoke. And that's because it makes them feel better. It helps control anxiety. It helps control depression. It helps them feel better. It helps them relax after a meal. It just helps everything work better. Except everything works less well later on, right? Uh, so it causes heart disease, it causes cancer, it causes, it causes all kinds of problems, right? So the answer is find a better solution for why you smoke. So you don't never take something away from somebody that has benefit unless you're giving them something better instead. And so we optimize magnesium and we, we deal with how anxiety and we treat treat the underlying issues. So we do comprehensive management and help people naturally get to the point where they don't need that cigarette anymore. And, uh, it, so quick, is it a, the, basically, at least the way I do lifestyle medicine, I, I do an hour per consultation, and we usually do, do labs, come up with strategies, address deficiencies, just taking vitamin D, actually helps people stop smoking. Taking magnesium helps people stop smoking. Uh, starting exercising after meals takes the place of having a cigarette after the meal. It, there's all kinds of things that take the place of smoking that now they're feeling better without smoking. Okay, so that's the goal, is, is to not vilify the smoker. They're doing it for a reason, because it makes them feel better, right? Um, so so then, then I, I do, typically we follow up 
usually initially after two weeks and then maybe another two weeks. It doesn't, once they, once they figure out what to do, it's pretty, pretty clear that they're going to benefit from it. Yeah. Uh, yes. Pardon me? No, it, it, the, my clinic is, is a standalone clinic with, uh, above the Rancho Family Medical Group uh, in Temecula. And uh, I used to work with the Rancho Family Medical Group, um, but, but uh, for the last uh, 13 years, I've had my own little clinic, just, just me. It's not big, just, it's in Temecula. But I work with people by Zoom as well, so people can... People don't have to leave their home and, and, and work with me. Okay, so I have, I have patients in New Zealand, Australia, and Africa, Europe, London, uh, but I prefer having patients in the US, a little easier. <laughs> okay, uh, so anyways, yeah, now another question in the back. Back, yes, sir. All right, all right, uh, interesting question. What about this, uh, something that's going around the internet about using nicotine patches or nicotine in general as a way to potentially treat uh, long COVID symptoms or, you know, symptoms that persist from COVID or even vaccine injury? And, and uh, yes, there, there's actually a lot of interesting information in that. The, the studies that were actually done on this that were published in medical journals and peer-reviewed. So this is not hearsay. This is well-documented research that people they had long, long-term symptoms after COVID or after COVID vaccine. Um, uh, if, they, if they took a seven milligram nicotine patch and wore it for seven days, that that resolved many of the symptoms of COVID that had not resolved for over a year or more uh, since they had the infection. Okay, so now I don't know how many people that works for. Um, you, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, a new concept, very novel idea, right, to use nicotine. But here's the rationale behind it. It's, see, we, we always used to be told that the, the spike protein uh, gets access to the cell via the ACE2 receptor, but, and that's true, it does that, okay, but it also gums up another receptor, which is the cholinergic nicotinic acid receptor, and so when, when, when uh, spike protein attaches to that cholinergic nicotinic acid receptor, it basically blocks the ability of the body to restore itself to good health in many respects, mechanistically. And so it's preventing healing, okay? And that, and that spike protein won't let go. It will just stay there indefinitely unless you have something that has a greater affinity for that receptor than spike protein. And apparently, according to the studies, nicotine has a greater affinity for that receptor. So when somebody puts a nicotine patch on, it dislodges the spike protein and if you're following Dr. McCullough's protocol, which is a great protocol of natokinase, bromelain, uh, and uh, a curcumin, that actually helps decrease inflammation and break up that spike protein that has been dislodged. So it can't do any more damage. So there's a lot of things that we can do to treat people who have long COVID or, or long vax, uh, or, or just, you know, just, had the initial series of the vaccine or maybe other boosters as well, there's things that we can do to limit that risk that's based on good, solid medical information. Yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, may be a valid uh, benefit. For instance, uh, you know, we've, we've known for years epidemiologically that smokers are less likely to get Parkinson's. Okay? And one of the theories behind that is that the nicotine from smoking actually helps prevent some of the pathology associated with Parkinson's. Now, what did I just suggest? Okay, okay so I'm just telling you what the research showed. Of course, it was an enigma. Okay? 
for, for, for another way to, uh, to another way to d- discuss this is that that you know that in Fiji, where they smoke like it's going out of style, right? I mean, they just smoke up a storm. They have very low rates of, of uh, lung cancer. But when the Fijians move from Fiji to Hawaii, and they have a much lower risk of a lower rate of smoking, okay, they actually have a higher rate of lung cancer. So, the, and you know what the, what the researchers finally figured out? That in Fiji, the cultural diet is rich in greens, but the Fijians in Hawaii do not get that many greens, so they don't get to protect the anti-carcinogenic protection of greens, which appears to be more important in protecting against cancer than not smoking. But once again, a, ver- a wise person would choose not to smoke and eat greens, right? Yeah. We got to think logically here. Yes, sir. What about the people who smoke greens? Why do you want to have cannabis? People who smoke what? Cannabis. Oh, a cannabis or weed. weed. Okay. Uh, I, I do not have information on that in COVID. Don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, you know, there's, um, I'll say one thing about, about, um, about uh, THC, which is the, act, the psychogenic uh, ingredient in marijuana, is that generally speaking, we suggest that it's neurotoxic, okay? Whereas CBD, which is also an ingredient in hemp or marijuana, is actually neural protective. Okay, so I'm an advocate of CBD, of hemp oil that is high in CBD, but not THC. Okay, so, and of course, there's different opinions on that. I'm just telling you where I t- typically fall on that. Um, all right, uh, are we one, yes, sir. Flu shot. Oh, flu, flu shot. Oh, flu shots, okay. Uh, um, <laughs> well, you know, if, if, you, if you pay any attention to the Cochrane reports, which are the highest level of evaluation of research on what works and what doesn't, and, um, and they have repeatedly said that the flu shots are not very effective. You know... Uh, so, you know, the, 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 the main argument is do what we know works. And I, iodine, for instance, just using iodine is so much more effective than any vaccine could ever be for a flu shot, right? Especially when a lot of people get the flu because they got the shot. One of my good friends who is a top executive at Loma Linda was being pressured to do this flu shot, even though he never did it, because they wanted the top management, the top executives to be examples for everybody else that was kind of being forced to do it. And so finally he relented. <laughs> He's a good friend of mine. <laughs> and he got the worst case of flu he'd had his whole life. He went into his doctor and said, man, this, this vaccine gave me the worst case of flu I've ever had. And the doctor says, that was not the flu. That was a flu-like illness. And he would not report it. Again, there's ways around integrity within the scientific community. And unfortunately, doctors have figured out a, a whole bunch of the ways around integrity. Is, is yeah. this flu shot, mRNA, MRNA related? Uh, I, you know, I don't know the answer to that, uh, but I know that the respiratory syncytial virus vaccine is mRNA. Yeah. You know, personally, you know, I've, I've talked to some of my colleagues initially when this, this technology was first coming out, and they were saying, man, how can you be against this? This is the most amazing, beautiful technology we've ever seen. You got this lipid nanoparticle that this little teeny fat envelope that's carrying this payload of a modified messenger RNA, and it's taking it where it needs to be, and it's like a great delivery system. It's just amazing 
amazing technology using genetic engineering. I'm going like, yeah, but there's no data that shows it's safe. Oh, no, they're saying it's safe. I've never seen any data that justifies to me that it's safe. Okay, in fact, everything I've ever read shows it's not safe. Okay, that's a, you know you know what lipid nanoparticle was the first designed by big, by the pharmaceutical company for to carry chemo to the brain. If you don't want to have toxic spike protein damaging your brain, then you shouldn't do something that carries the genetic material that, that stimulates the production of spike protein in your brain. Okay, uh, and we'll end with this. Uh, you know, I, I, I didn't know, you know, just like most people didn't know in, uh, in early 2021, what was gonna happen, right? I knew, I read the Pfizer study, which made me think like, I don't know how they, they, there was a unanimous approval based on this study, because I read the study, okay? And more people died in the vaccine group than in the control group. So how could they say that's safe? Even though it was empowered, the study was empowered to determine death rate, how can they say it protects against death and hospitalization if it actually increased death? You know, I mean, it's like, Come on, you know, it just didn't make any sense at all. So I'm, I have all these questions. And, um, and so my biggest concern was that they, they, they stopped the double-blind study in early January, which means that most people who were enrolled in that double-blind study, the Pfizer COVID vaccine study, were only in that study for two months before it was unblinded. That is not good research. In fact, that's horrible research. Anybody who knows anything about epidemiology, and I've taken most of the classes at the School of Public Health on epidemiology and research, uh, would say you'd have to have a follow-up for at least 10 years to see whether that's safe or not. Remember what the Cleveland Clinic study showed. The Cleveland Clinic study showed that you increase the risk of COVID by 100% with each vaccine. Increased. Okay, and, and by the way, my main concern wasn't the increased risk of COVID. I could care less about the COVID compared to the other concerns because we know how to prevent COVID by just doing these natural strategies. So there's ways to address that. What I'm concerned about is what it really means, which means the immune system has been depressed. There's a greater risk for everything. There's that, that acquired immune deficiency syndrome. That's my concern. There's a reason why many doctors are raising a concern about what we call turbo cancers. If you Google turbo cancers, Wikipedia would say, this is basically misinformation. Turbo cancer just means cancers are popping up that are much more rapidly growing than ever before and, and progress that uh, ca colon cancers in 20 and 30 year olds instead of 50, 60 year olds. Stage four, I recently had a stage four um, pancreatic cancer patient, 35. And you know, he said, man, it's the worst mistake I ever made. You know, and, uh, and, and so he's, he's fighting for his life right now. He's given a year to live even in the best case scenario with chemo. Okay, so, so again, th these cancers are, are really serious right now, and, the, and many doctors are recognizing that this, this, the cancer uptick uh, is associated with vaccine uptake. Okay, so anyways, I, I don't know how much more plain I can be than that. <laughs> okay. increase. In, yeah, increase. The increase in the vaccine. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, much more, more research needs to be done to better understand that. The problem is they're not allowing that research to be done. I have a spiritual question. Okay, we got a spiritual question. Do you, do you, have any, do you connect this with Revelation 18.23? If you don't know, I'll give you... Read it to us. Well, it says... Uh, you, you can use your... For the mighty men of the earth and by their sorceries all the nations... Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm already, I'm already in enough trouble as it is, well, Pastor. <laughs>
Okay. Um, so, you know, again, the, the, the goal here is to find what's best, take advantage of what's best in conventional medicine, what's best in natural medicine and lifestyle medicine. Okay, but we need to be very thoughtful in, in how we move forward in today's, in today's scientific era. This is a very different world that we live in in the last few years. And so that's why, that's why my message on, on searching for truth is so critical. Because if you just trust the, whoever tells you to do something, you're, you're deferring in a way that could actually drastically affect your life and your health. So, so um, be careful and pay attention and, and study, the, study the experts that have clearly a motivation to benefit you and help you. Uh, okay, a couple more questions and it's five o'clock. That's a good time to quick. So, okay, so I'm gonna do three more questions. One, two, and three. Yes, yes, one. Oh, okay. Just curious, do you ever get sick suffering? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's a great question. Okay, so I'm not going to pretend like I never get sick. Okay, so for instance, I was the main author on the, on the uh, Liberty and Conscience document that was sent out to the General Conference on dealing with the issue of mandates and how to, how to, handle, con uh, how to an uh, handle the issue of people who wanted religious exemptions. Okay, and you know, uh, say no more, but that, that was horribly handled by our church. As it was by every church, by the way. So we were no different. And that's what makes me sad, because we should have been different. Okay, so, so I was the main author on the medical side of that presentation that went out to all the leaders of our church. Okay, um, and, and then there was other authors that were involved with the spiritual, the, 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 the religious side. For them to say that this was a public health matter and therefore not a religious liberty issue was missing the whole point. The whole reason it was a religious liberty issue was because it was a public health issue, okay? I mean, that's like telling Daniel, come on, Daniel, we're talking about food and wine here, that's a public health issue, okay? They're doing it because they want you to be healthy enough, so just do it, man. It's a public health issue, it's not a religious liberty issue. Daniel would have accepted that argument, and he didn't, and he was willing to die for it. So, so Daniel 1 pretty much blows that argument out of the water. And, um, and so, um, so the reason I'm telling you that <laughs> is because I was stressed out putting that document together. It fell on me to complete it. So we had uh, submissions from all kinds of other doctors and scholars, and, and many times the way that in, information was, was submitted was actually reading incorrectly. And so because I understand research and studies, I had to rewrite everything so that it was not only saying what we wanted to say, but actually be accurate scientifically as well. And that was very stressful. And so I was, I was staying up, just like I did last night, preparing for this sermon, Pastor. I stayed up to 1, 2 in the morning, almost most mornings, working on this over Christmas. This is Christmas of 2021. And, um, and, and, and then because I was not feeling well, I was not sleeping well, I was stressed out, and it was the holidays, so I, I, I kind of gave in to the holiday treats a little bit. Right. So the very time where I shouldn't have been doing it because I was under stress, I wasn't sleeping properly. My immune system was depressed. I went, I, I, I participated in some sweets, etc. that I should I, I knew better. But, you know, sometimes we just do stuff even though we know better. Right. Uh, and so I got I got a bad case of COVID over that Christmas break. Now, here's the interesting part. I didn't have any respiratory symptoms at all. All I had was fatigue. That's the only problem I had, just fatigue. But that was really bad fatigue, which, which means that my immune system, because I knew what to do, right? I had all these techniques and strategies at my fingertips. You know, I've had 
four, 35 years of experience doing this. So I was, doing, I was doing everything. And even everything I did, I was still majorly fatigued for over a week. And then I, I maintained some fatigue for another three weeks. So it hit me hard. I know that that was bad for my, my n- nervous system, my brain. I know it was bad for my heart. I know it was bad for my immune system. And so I'm still doing some strategies that McCullough would advocate because of that event that I went through. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay, there was, uh, yes, ma'am. Let's do this one at a time. Okay, so, so the question is aluminum and vaccines. Well, there's aluminum in chemtrails. There's aluminum in chemtrails. Okay, so, well, it's, either way, it's aluminum. Okay, so the, here's the problem. You know, it used to be that chemtrails was just a, you know, a, a conspiracy theory. It's not. It's well documented. Every government admits to doing it. Okay, it's, I mean, it's obvious, not natural. It's obviously not normal for airplanes to do that, right? They're doing it on purpose for various weather, weather modification reasons, et cetera. The problem is it's, it's uh, full of, of chemicals, and, and particularly aluminum oftentimes. Dr. Um, Russell Blaylock, famous neurosurgeon and neuroscientist, who I still have some of his old note, uh, textbooks that he wrote, super high IQ uh, uh, neuroscientist, he actually went to the conferences where experts were presenting on weather modification and the techniques that they were using. And he stood up and he challenged and says, are you, you're doing this without ever asking the question of the potential risk to the public health? And they didn't know what to say to him because these were all government sponsored strategies, right? So it's definitely happening. There's aluminum in every. I mean, um, uh, how many people cook with and, and preserve and, and cover, cover food with aluminum foil? That's really bad for you. You should know. Okay, so don't do it anymore, right? Okay, I mean, how many of us have, have, uh, have uh, baked a potato in aluminum foil or corn? Corn on the cob, you know, in, in, in a fireplace, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I used to do it all the time. Really bad for the brain. Now, a lot of doctors would say there's no evidence that aluminum is bad for the brain. I, I, I beg to differ. For a long time, just because there's no evidence doesn't mean it's a wise thing to do. Because aluminum is a toxin to the nervous system. We know that. And even if we don't have a study that it actually causes Alzheimer's, it's still prudent to avoid it, right? Now there's more and more evidence by the professors that know the most that we should avoid aluminum as much as possible. Yep, aluminum in any form should be avoided. Don't, don't cook in aluminum pans, you know, just stay away from aluminum. Okay, just a second. Okay, it was a follow-up question and then one more question and then we'll have to... I have to let you go home and have have dinner. Yes. Turmeric. Okay. So, what about uh, our turmeric for arthritis? I'm a big fan of, of uh, turmeric or turmeric. The different ways we can say it. Um, Clinically, what I use is a micronized or a nanotechnology form of curcumin. So curcumin 95 is 20 times more potent than than turmeric is in terms of its curcumin content. So so if you're, I'm a fan of using turmeric as a spice. I like to get organic tofu, firm tofu, and, 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 uh, stir fry it in its own juices with, with a whole bunch of turmeric. That's good stuff, okay? But in addition to that, for clinical purposes, I use the curcumin 95 
which is 20 times more potent per dose. And then more recently, I've been using called Theracurumin, which is 20 times more absorbable than the regular curcumin 95. So people that have like rheumatoid arthritis or an autoimmune or a lot of inflammation, then I recommend using that more potent form of curcumin. It, it, well, the, product, the brand name that I use is called Theracurmin. Uh, but there's, there, you know, there's all kinds of good products out there. Uh, but you just want to make sure you're using a clinical grade, highly absorbable product. I'm not a fan of the pepper ones. They have pepper because they say that increases the absorption. Well, of course it does because it causes micro perforations. So that's not a that's not a that's not a good way to increase absorption of turmeric, right, or curcumin. So that's why I prefer the nanotech, the uh, forms of uh, highly absorbable curcumin. And you had a follow-up question? I know, just a second. Well, okay, so that, that gets into a whole other venue of, um, there's, actually, there's actually a paper trail in the research on this. There's, it's well known that there's many medical companies, pharmaceutical medical companies, that use portions of different venoms, whether it's snake venoms or uh, other forms of venoms, to, to create medications. There's, there's no question. The, 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 the whole issue with Ozempic, okay, uh, is it's, it's, it's based on a synthetic version of Gila monster venom, okay? And frankly, that's one reason I, I have questions about that. Uh, I wouldn't want to subject my body to that because that is a neurotoxin, okay? So, it, you know, it helps people lose weight dramatically. It helps people reverse their diabetes. I'm not sure that's a healthy way to reverse diabetes, though. Okay? You're basically removing your appetite because you're slowing down digestion and, and, and other, other reasons. And so why don't you just eat a healthy diet and lose weight that way? Okay, so it's kind of a simple step to kind of force people to not want to eat. But I suspect there's going to be huge consequences from Ozempic in the future. And I, I can't prove that right now, but um, I, I'm concerned about the cancer rates relative to that. And, and some people will have uh, gastric paralysis that's complete. They just throw up every day of their li the rest of their lives. You know, it's, it's a rare side effect, but that should be a warning that is probably not a healthy thing to do. Yeah. All right, last question, follow up. Okay. So um, the question is what about charcoal and cleansing the gut? How do we do this? Um, one, of, one of the uh, top clinicians in, in the UK, in, in England, has very thoughtful clinician. You know, he's basically always doing what's best for his patient, figuring it out. He's a conventional doctor. He's trying to figure out what to do for his patients. He was recently interviewed um, by another physician in the UK in a, in a, web, in a channel called Vihon Health. Vihon Health. It's really a good, a good uh, channel. And uh, uh, he, he, this physician in Europe was saying that one of the problems with viral infections that we've been experiencing of late is that these viruses, like the COVID virus, they infect bacteria in our gut. Uh, and they infect like the E. coli bacteria. It's okay to have a little bit of E. coli, you just don't want a lot of it. And so, these, the, the, so the, they, it becomes a bacterial phage, meaning it's a virus that's now protected because it's inside the bacteria. So now the immune system can't get rid of the virus, and it's already, it's already used to that E. coli, so it's not going to get rid of it. Okay, so now we have a virus that can replicate and live forever inside of our body. 
And that's one of the reasons why there seems to be this ongoing symptoms that could last decade, over a decade. Okay, very bad news, right? So the, the physician is saying, when this virus infects the bacteria, it causes the bacteria to produce toxins 24-7. We need to have a way to get rid of these toxins. So this is where potentially charcoal comes in, is that we're now using the charcoal to bind those toxins and to get rid of them before they have the negative effect on whatever they're damaging, right? So, so the, the, the challenge is that we got to balance that with, let's say somebody's taking some other medications, like an antibiotic or any, any prescription medication. If you take charcoal within two to three hours of that, it'll bind that medication and inactivate it. Some people are suggesting, and I don't have any verification of this, it's just they're saying because certain medications have a half-life of so many hours that that medication is not really out of your system or hasn't done its full job for, let's say, a day or day and a half. So if you take charcoal within that period, you minimize the benefit of that medication. I'm not sure I, I accept that right now. My goal is that that medication is still going to do most of its job during those, it gets absorbed into the body, Within, if you do it like three hours before the charcoal or more, I don't think there's going to be interference. Okay, at least not much. Because the medicine's already been absorbed and the charcoal stays in the gut. It never goes inside the body, it stays in the gut. Okay, so, so I like a protocol for, for things like this, people that have strange ongoing illness, do some charcoal at bedtime, maybe three or four days a week, and then, and then use your other strategies other times of the week, like in the morning, where you're taking, you know, a various herbs or natural supplements to help stim stimulate the immune system or fight off bacteria or viral infections. And there's a lot of things that, that fit into that category. Uh, and then the, the third thing, and this is really important, is that Dr. Hassan, a, 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 a top-rated gastroenterologist, um, who's an award-winning gastroenterologist. She has her own lab. So early on in COVID, she started recruiting her doctor colleagues to test uh, stool samples to see, to see um, what was happening to the healthy bacteria, the bifidobacteria, the lactobacilli type probiotics. And she discovered that when you get COVID, it destroys your bifidobacteria and your lactobacillus, which means your microbiome, the, the, the gut flora, is no longer able to activate the immune system like it used to be able to. 70% of your entire immune system is located in the gut. It's called the GALT, or the gut-associated lymphatic tissue. 70%, and it's influenced by, mostly by the microbiome, which is the healthy bacteria in your gut. So if you don't have healthy bacteria in your gut, you're not activating your 70% of your immune system properly. This is really, really critical. So she found that the do her doctor friends who'd had the COVID vaccine had near zero levels, typically zero levels of bifidobacteria, which means that you gotta re-inoculate the body with bifidobacteria and lactobacilli probiotics, which can be done orally uh, in some cases, it can be done as, a, as, a, as an enema, okay? And, of course, for, for any of your doctors in the audience, you know that um, a, a, a fecal transplant can actually cure many conditions where you, you, take, you take a healthy stool sample from, obviously, somebody who's healthy, and you, and you, uh, you basically introduce that into the colon uh, of a sick person, and it helps them heal. So, it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's, on the surface, it seems to be a very barbaric, you know, like insane thing to do, but it's one of the most beneficial strategies when used properly. Okay, so the, you, you, can, you can get bifidobacteria orally too, so you don't necessarily have to rush to get a fecal transplant even though that's easier said than done. You have to go through a lot of 
a lot of red tape to get a fecal transplant at a hospital. Um, all right, so, uh, you know, let, let's, uh, let's just maybe end with a word of prayer, if, you, if I may, Pastor. Uh, Father, I want to thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak candidly, to speak openly, uh, as we're seeking to better understand this wonderful and, and uh, amazing creation of yours, how we wish to be the best stewards possible overseeing the care of, of your temple, okay? Uh, that, that our body is the temple of your spirit, Lord, and we want this temple to uh, allow your spirit to reside in the healthiest way possible. We know that spiritual things are spiritually discerned, Lord, but we also know that spiritual things are discerned through our, uh, our emotional intelligence and, and our ability to think and critically uh, evaluate information. So we pray, Lord, that you'll give us the wisdom okay, and the fortitude and the desire to study to show ourselves approved, to not just defer judgment to people in leadership positions, but to ask questions and determine for ourselves what the truth really is. We thank you for that opportunity, Lord. And we, I pray, Lord, that you, that you go with every family represented here today. Give them, uh, give them peace, give them joy, and give them health because of the knowledge that they have attained. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, time to, time to eat. <laughs> Is there supper ready, you know? <laughs>